Today we look at St. Petersburg, what we consider a core Tartarian city, a federal city in Russia. St. Petersburg has an interesting official account in history. And as we know, if you have an interesting and very complicated account in history, it tends to be accepted because we enjoy our interesting stories. Looking at St. Petersburg, though, you'll find no shortage of extraordinary old world buildings. And not just the major edifices that we'll be looking at in this exploration, but everywhere you look in this city. Let's begin our exploration of St. Petersburg and see what a true core city of Tartaria looks like. Why do we consider St. Petersburg a core city of Tartaria? Well, if we go off the theory that the surviving remnants of Tartaria, or the civilization that preceded ours, was centered around the Arctic Circle, then we realize that St. Petersburg is located not too far from the Arctic Circle. It's located basically along the line of latitude of 59 degrees north, the Arctic Circle being at 66 degrees north. Of course, they modify that based on the tilt of the Earth, blah, 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 blah. Make of it what you will. However, it's interesting that there are many cities such as St. Petersburg, that seem to survive across what is today Russia. And a lot of the primary architecture has been preserved. When we look at the layout of St. Petersburg, we see the same design patterns that we've seen in other cities, especially in our recent explorations in the United States. St. Petersburg seems to bear a bit of a resemblance to New Orleans, at least in terms of how it was founded. Yes, they use that word again. In the same time frame as New Orleans. And, of course, it has numerous star forts. Or, we'll just say, geometrically beautiful locations. Naturally, the star fort here is simply an isolated military post that defends from sea and land attack. However, we always think that there's much more behind these star forts. St. Petersburg was founded in 1703 by Tsar Peter the Great, and this was one of the transformative events of Russia from a nation into an empire. When it defeated the Swedish Empire, yes, apparently Sweden had an empire too in the early 18th century, in what was called the Great Northern War. When we see these structures and we consider these accounts, there is much more to St. Petersburg than meets the eye. The official account tells us that, after defeating the Swedes, that Peter the Great decided to found a city in 1703. And this is only 15 years before New Orleans, but it may as well be 1,500 years, because as we know in the 18th century, a lot could be accomplished well before the Industrial Revolution and even the advent of the railroad. We look at these older pictures of St. Petersburg and we see the very impressive architecture. And what's truly extraordinary about St. Petersburg is just how many examples of it there are everywhere you look. It's not just the major edifices. And even here we can see in this example of St. Isaac's Cathedral that we'll be looking at, the statues and all the infrastructure and detail that goes into it. There's really not that much difference when you consider some of the architectural stylings, but what makes St. Petersburg unique is the fact that there is just an extraordinary amount of this architecture that survives. And it's clear that what we're looking at is a former core city of the previous civilization that on this channel we refer to as Tartaria. Now there is a little bit of confusion because there's supposedly the remnants of Tartaria on many maps that's depicted, and that's more in what's now the Siber Siberia region of Russia. However, I believe that what this likely is, is that for whatever reason, there was a large surviving enclave of the previous civilization, and we see remnants of its architecture, and it just happened to be in this geographical area. Could be wrong, this is a theory, but I'm just explaining this is how this channel goes about approaching, explaining this theory, and why you have these extraordinary examples of this surviving architecture in Russia and in the St. Petersburg area. Looking at this column, and the general staff building, we see a very large compound. We see so many examples of beauty that are normally associated with the royalty in Europe. And the official explanation is that Peter and then the subsequent members of the Romanov family, that was the family that were the czars in Russia, they wanted to emulate the great achievements of Europe and they wanted to build their own neoclassical architecture. And even though Moscow was viewed as the traditional capital city of Russia, and even Napoleon thought this when he occupied Russia, and the Tsar at the time was just hanging out up here in St. Petersburg and didn't have a care in the world that there was a large army in Russia. Well, I'm sure he cared, but we're supposed to believe that Napoleon brought an army of over half a million and lived off the land and managed to sustain it when they didn't have railroads at the time. But that's all right. It's a great story, and the more complicated and the more intricate the story is, it tends to be the accepted historical account. Looking at all these 
wondrous structures in all these older pictures. These are supposedly from the 19th century. Some of them have some interesting discrepancies in them. We see the same things that we see when we look at the old pictures of the cities that we've explored in the United States. Unbelievable architecture with tremendous accomplishments and yet an existing infrastructure that seems to indicate that there's some sort of power system in place. I mean, was there the telegraph? Was there electricity going on? A lot of these columns and these pillars and these walls look like they've been there much longer than since 1703. It's always intriguing when you consider the fact, though, that these cities were built on a very shortened timeline. We would expect the history of St. Petersburg to go back to thousands of years, such as many of the cities in Europe. And yet, it started as merely a modest Swedish fortress in the early 18th century. The entire Russian Empire was built from winning the Great Northern War. And there's also interesting accounts from the Great Northern War of how the Swedish army was caught out during one of the worst winters in recorded history, and many died by simply freezing to death. That always seems to happen inconveniently. Peter was more determined, and even though the Russian army was not supposedly as proficient as the Swedish army, they managed to win several great victories. And yet, St. Petersburg was also known for its prominence during World War II when the Wehrmacht attempted to capture it for over three years and the city was in a state of siege. Many starved and died, and it was a very dramatic moment of World War II. However, for reasons unknown, the Wehrmacht, the German Defense Forces, which is what Wehrmacht literally translates to, interestingly enough, were unwilling or unable to commit the appropriate military resources to actually seize St. Petersburg, or Leningrad as it was called during the Soviet regime. Very tragic human story that no doubt occurred, and yet there's all these accounts of the, this destruction and what appears to be death on a very high human scale, and yet despite that, many of the wondrous structures in St. Petersburg survive to this day, and we have images that document them from the 19th century to this day. So once again, it's a very unique and interesting account. And it almost seems as though that the more interesting and the more complicated the historical account that can be given to us is, we tend not to question it. Because people love a good story. And I suppose there's nothing wrong with loving a good story. But we have to remain objective. And we see that there's a lot more that may be involved in the true account of what's really happened in St. Petersburg that we have to consider. The structures across this city are not something that we can easily be explained. The official account will tell us that many of them were established by the czars, and they had forced labor, and that's how they managed to achieve these incredible things long before the Industrial Revolution and the advent of the railroad. Yet you will find that there is no shortage of buildings and structures across the city that would easily fill the wondrous art books of an account of a lost great world and a lost great wonder and glory that we can't easily explain. When I look at St. Petersburg, I see a city that exceeds anything that we've looked at in the United States and even the cities that I've seen in Europe. And remember that St. Petersburg was not the original capital city of Russia. It was Moscow. Yet, from the early 18th century as part of their great victory over the Swedish Empire, this was the city that the Tsars built out of nothing in a very short amount of time to be their great capital city. And as is the affiliated concept with Russia, at least from the United States, Russia always loves to do things larger and greater. This is an interesting looking structure. It almost looks like one of the many arcades that we've seen, especially with the skylighting. We'll be looking into St. Petersburg more in future explorations. This is just merely an overview to give us an idea of what's there. And we start with the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood, built from 1883 to 1907. And here we see a truly extraordinary structure with a lot of advanced architecture and advanced construction that goes into it. You'll also find, though, that there are similar patterns that we've seen in many of the structures that we've looked at in the United States and in some of the explorations we've done elsewhere. Similar patterns where there's this constant renovation, there's constant natural disaster, and you have to question, are we looking at the original structure, or has it been altered in ways and in time over the years? This is, quite frankly, a fairy tale palace, and that's the only way to describe this edifice with a name that's just so easy to say and say quickly at that. 
beautiful onion domes and towers, large adornments over every window, smaller columns that build up into a magnificent arch. All the capabilities of Imperial Russia in the late 19th century on full display here. And yet when you look at the surrounding buildings, you see nothing less impressive in the great architecture. This is definitely one of the types of buildings that tends to be associated with popular perception with Russia. And yet, oftentimes, people simply explain it away as saying they had forced labor and simply the will to do all these incredible things. Yet, I think this is the finest example of how we see that there are similarities with the architecture in locations all across the land. You can see some of the coloring on some of the towers in the classic onion domes. And was this original coloring or was this added later? The interior is no less impressive. You'll find some of the most extensive and beautiful mosaics across the world within this structure. And even considering the floor and the giant pillars. Once again, this is something that defies simple explanation. And one of the statements about St. Petersburg or Leningrad is that it is a city of many cathedrals. And there are certainly many cathedrals. And it's very intriguing when we consider the fact that the official account, at least in the United States, is that the Soviet Union didn't really care for religion. And in fact, many of these cathedrals were supposedly repurposed as museums. And here, looking at the ornate beauty of some of these smaller columns that build up into what appears to be a great altar. These are many structures that I would love to visit in person and really get an idea for what's really being represented here in St. Petersburg. What I think this really shows us, though, is that this is a clear example of the remnants of a great civilization that preceded ours. And when you see this, and while this may be controversial to even suggest, it's very hard to deny that that's actually what's really going on here, unless we want to simply accept the official account that it was just forced labor. Well, much like in the United States, Russia also has its very convincing construction photos, and they do give us a very convincing construction photo of this great edifice. You know, because why not? Well, let's move on to Kazan Cathedral, built 1801 to 1811. So we start in the 19th century, and here we can already see we've got this wonderful dome and pediment and many, many, many columns. And this is yet another very well-documented building, and I'm extremely impressed that, once again, it only took them 10 years to construct this. And the explanation will be the same as any other edifice. It was forced labor, and, of course, the will of the czars would be imposed on the people. I always find it interesting, though, when you look at the historical account of how the czars and the Romanov family fell in Russia, and how it seems that people were willing to tolerate it when they were supposedly winning foreign wars, but then once World War I went against them, people had just had enough. Now, yes, I know the official history is a lot more complicated than that. Remember what we said about complicated history. When it's more interesting, people tend to accept it and they don't question it. You see on the dome here, though, many of the same styling cues that we've seen in many of the state capitals across the United States. You have the portal windows and the elaborate top. It is safe to say, though, that there is something that's even more decorative, though, about these edifices that we see in St. Petersburg. All these cathedrals, and yet any one of them, seem like they could be repurposed as a museum, as some sort of large municipal building. Or if you're in the United States, this would make a wondrous state capital, or even a federal capital. And yet all the architectural stylings look exactly the same in structures that we've seen across the land. And this is the prime detail that a lot of people will simply ignore. And they'll say that, well, Russia at that time just wanted to be like Europe even though Europe was supposedly rediscovering this type of quote-unquote neoclassical architecture at the same time, and just everybody happened to be proficient, architects were running around all over the place, and they had this skilled labor, even though we're told in many places this was forced labor that did this. Very interesting symbol there in the middle of that pediment, and yet all these columns are very well adorned. And how many columns are there in this building total? Again, this is something else I'd love to see on site and count. There are many pictures, though, that show different states of this building, and that wouldn't be too hard to explain, especially with the official account that St. Petersburg was under a state of siege for over 900 days during World War II. And yet, for whatever reason, the German military and, of course, the nation of Finland, which was an Axis ally during World War II, was unwilling to continue the advance, and the German military was unwilling to reassign their 11th Army to seize St. Petersburg. Again, another conflicting account of hyper-military competence and incompetence. 
And there's also a statement about the statue of Peter the Great that precludes anyone from ever seizing St. Petersburg. Ah, uh, yes, here's this interesting symbol again. Not exactly a symbol we'd associate with the Tsars of Russia, but no matter. And the interior of this cathedral is no less impressive. As if you didn't see enough columns on the inside, well, we have even more beautiful and well-adorned columns on the inside. And we see the same styling in the ceiling that we've seen in cathedrals and churches across the United States. Very interesting. And, of course, we have hundreds of years between the build times, and yet it's exactly alike. Of course, I would enjoy to see any of these supposed architects now try to design and someone try to build a building like this now. Someone will tell me in the comments that, you know, there is an architect that can do something like this. Perhaps there is, but I always find it at best to be a very perfunctory effort, and it does not match the quality of the construction materials and the quantity of these buildings that were being churned out all over the land, according to the official historical account. But remember, it's very interesting, and it's very complicated. So don't ask any questions, and as long as you don't ask any questions, you can accept the account as given. There's that symbol again. Hmm. Well, we can explain it away. St. Isaac's Cathedral, built 1818 to 1858. Now, they do give a little bit more of a, I'm not going to say realistic timeline, but something that we'd expect with 30 years to put up this wondrous cathedral. And, of course, this is something that you can say resembles a wonderful capital within the United States. Look at the detail within the pediment, though. And I find that very intriguing. Now, apparently the architect did a model, and this is that model. And even on this little small model, the detail within the pediment doesn't come close to matching the actual real-life detail. Well, I guess it's true what they say. In Russia, if it's bigger, it's more complicated. We don't have a construction photo, but we have a very convincing construction drawing of this wondrous cathedral. And as you can see, it shows many of the same stylings that we see in the photo. Isn't that an interesting coincidence? Wondrous detail all across this cathedral. And again, statues with halos behind them all over. Again, as though they had all the ability to do all this kind of detail. Now, of course, we can explain this one maybe a little bit more proficiently because they do give a 30-year construction timeline. Once again, though, railroads were in their latent phase, and we have drawings like this, a two-dimensional drawing that supposedly shows exactly how the dome in this cathedral was constructed. And we've seen similar drawings with similar buildings across the land. I still can't get over just how ornate and detailed the interior of the pediment is. And then when you look at the columns leading up into the dome, there's something about this cathedral that even seems to exceed many of the state capitals that we've looked at in the United States. And I find it fascinating that the primary survival of a previous civilization would be so wonderfully depicted here in Russia. Because... In the United States, we're often told that uh, Russia serves many different purposes. At one point, it's the great foil. At another point, it's a worthy opponent. It just depends what time frame in the United States you're going off of. Looking at the interior, though, of this cathedral, you see many of the great columns and the beautiful pillars that are adorned in the exact same way of the columns and the pillars that we've seen in buildings across the land. And to say nothing about the gorgeous paintings on the inside of this incredible building... And once again, I wonder what the floor is actually constructed out of. It would be interesting to be able to go in person and really verify what the construction materials of this building actually is, or at least get an idea of what it really is. Is it a combination of marble, sandstone, granite? That's what will be told any structure in the United States or the other lands are. And I suspect it's the same story here for Russia that we always say it's granite. Look at the dome. And you get that otherworldly impression looking up in the dome. And here we have even more beautiful figures that surround the dome and the windows and the natural light. And I'm just completely impressed by how they were able to construct a building where they allowed natural light to come in and show such a series of incredible images. Something we just don't seem to have the ability to do today. No matter how much glass we put in our great towers and skyscrapers. And, of course, it's explained that this is a religious building, and we'll also be told it was repurposed as a museum. Well, let's go to the General Staff Building, 1819 to 1829. Officially, this was built to commemorate Russia's victory over Napoleon. And this is quite an extensive compound, and it's actually part of a much larger compound. And here you're looking on the inside of it. Very impressive for early 19th century and the wondrous achievements of the 
czar and their architects at that time. Of course, the official explanation is that they had an infinite amount of forced labor. And wait until we look at the Winter Palace and consider that account. Another great column and something that even rivals such places as the Vatican. And of course, it matches the official explanation that they simply wanted to match the glory and the grandeur of Europe. Well, why? I mean, to me, it seems like they're vastly exceeding it, but, you know, make of it what you will. Wonderful columns and arches, and yet, oddly enough, these statues on the top don't seem to be something that necessarily reflect what we'd associate with traditional Russian culture. It seems to be more of that, uh, I don't want to say Rome, but oddly enough, we have the same figures that we see in the United States in strange places such as Des Moines in the Iowa State Capitol. And yes, I go back to that because those figures remind me of that. The sheer size of this compound, again with the columns that are integrated into the wall, and then of course all these very pretty base stones that you see. And again, looking closely at the statue with our horses and chariots and what appear to be our <laughs> Roman Greco adorned figures. I guess, you know, everybody wanted to be neoclassical. This is a view of the compound, and on the top you can see the general staff building, and then on the bottom you see the Winter Palace, again built by the Tsars, and we'll look at that in a moment. This is just to give you an idea of how many buildings look like this and how many are located in this immediate vicinity. And just consider the sheer size of the Winter Palace and then the General Staff Building. So the General Staff Building was supposed to be constructed for military purposes and to commemorate the victory over Napoleon. And then the Winter Palace was supposed to be the main palace of the Tsars. All in the same compound, but then you see not just the main buildings, but also all the surrounding buildings have this incredible architectural styling to them. I mean, honestly, we could spend days, weeks, and months doing videos about St. Petersburg. And now we go to the Winter Palace, built 1730s to 1837. It was the fourth palace on the site. It supposedly has 1,500 rooms, and given the size of it, I see no reason to doubt that. Here's a view of it from the water. And yes, calling this a palace is very appropriate, not just with the decoration, but just the sheer number of columns that are integrated in the wall, and yet you see the same architectural stylings that we see in many other buildings. This is a very extensive structure. And it is very appropriate to call this a palace. But many of you might be asking, well, how exactly does this compare to other palaces? Well, let's compare it to Buckingham Palace. And here you can see Buckingham Palace superimposed on the Winter Palace. Once again, it matches the classic stereotype that in Russia they do everything bigger. Well, it's not just a little bigger in this particular case. We're told that the Winter Palace, though, had a fire in 1837, and that it was rebuilt by thousands of workers, and many died daily. And they were simply replaced. I guess it was just that easy to find skilled labor at that time. There's many depictions, though, that show just how complicated and ornate not just the decorations of the Winter Palace is, but the actual layout of it is, and the functions behind it. Now, the interior of the Winter Palace is interesting to consider because it's hard to find photographs that show it directly, but there are a lot of paintings and a lot of demonstrations that show that there is a beauty and a complexity to the interior of the Winter Palace that just exceeds anything that we've seen in many of the other edifices that we've looked at in our explorations over the time. And this is something I find truly extraordinary about the account of St. Petersburg, because if these are real depictions, and there are pictures that do give a little bit of reinforcement that these are real depictions, then this is really a surviving building from a previous civilization that exceeds our wildest dreams. Because as if there weren't enough columns on the exterior of this building, the columns on the inside of this building seem to go way beyond the concept of simple forced labor. And when you look at all the decorations and the fact that it seems as though there was no limitation, you look at the historical account that, yes, it took them 100 years to build this building. It built in a fire. And here's an actual photo, for example. Then they had to use forced labor to rebuild the building. And it just seems as though they had whatever they needed whenever they needed. You didn't need a railroad. You didn't need any heavy machinery. This was all pulled off at a time when such things were not even available. And it should be noted that this isn't the only very largest in the world structure or object that's located in St. Petersburg. Just astounding views, though, from the exterior. And you can see that every single window is adorned. Numerous columns on both floors, and here we have an interior picture where once again we see the columns that are integrated in the wall and the beauty on the ceiling. 
and just opulence that exceeds the ability of words to describe. And of course, you know, the story of the czars and how ruthless they were and how unfortunate it was that many people suffered for hundreds of years accepting this rule, but then once things got bad enough, they were finally able to revolt. Looking at the interior, though, I believe this is called the small throne room. Again, you see more of this wondrous detail and, again, more beautiful designs within the floor. Supposedly, this structure was repurposed, or at least a portion of it, repurposed as a hospital during World War I. Interesting to see hospital beds underneath those chandeliers with all those columns around there. Well, let's look at the Bronze Horsemen, the commemoration of Peter the Great, built 1768 to 1782. The Thunderstone that it rests on is 1,500 metric tons, cut down to 1,200. This is supposedly the largest stone ever moved by human beings, the Thunderstone that this statue of Peter the Great rests on. Yes, apparently they cut it out from the rock. The name Thunderstone comes from the crack of lightning and thunder that supposedly preceded it, and then they moved it over the snow and ice to put it in its present position to build this statue of Peter on top of Tsar Peter after he had achieved his great victory over the Swedish Empire and founded the city of St. Petersburg in 1703. Just considering the fact, though, that this official historical account tells us that they moved this thunderstone and that it's the largest object moved by human beings, although we can certainly debate that because we've seen other large stones across the land, it's still impressive, though, to consider that this was achieved and done. And you should consider the fact that much smaller stones that weigh far less being moved even a couple miles by modern machinery and modern transportation is very difficult. Well, they also have the Tsar Bell, cast 1733 to 1735, largest bell in the world, weighing 445,000 pounds, or 201,000 kilograms. Yes, a bell that was never hung, but for some reason was cast, because I guess they just need to have the largest things in the world in Russia. And of course, that's what we'll be told when we don't actually live in Russia to explain these things. The Peter and Paul Cathedral, built 1712 to 1733, oldest landmark in St. Petersburg. And I think this is a rather astounding landmark as well, because early 18th century, again, no heavy machinery, just forced labor. And we'll be told that's how this incredible edifice was constructed. I don't know. When you look and you see how this tower just reaches to the sky. Now, this is supposedly the burial plot of the czars, and this was the cathedral that they were buried in, and this being a very prominent landmark in St. Petersburg. It should also be noted, though, that looking at it more objectively, we see that there's a very peculiar structure that uh, this particular edifice is within. And these are the structures that we've seen all over the place that we'll colloquially refer to as star forts or star structures. So not only do you have this amazing edifice with this very unique tower in the middle of it, but it's also in the middle of a very peculiar structure that I really wonder what exactly it's made out of. And look, as if it's not enough, they even throw a little pediment with some columns over there on an entryway to it. So if this was all achieved, according to the official historical account, then it, it just isn't something that is very acceptable given what we're given with the limited amount of time frames, the limited capabilities at the time. You have to accept whatever you're told just because it's a complicated and interesting story. And I don't believe that in the case of St. Petersburg, it stands up to scrutiny. It seems very clear that there was a wondrous civilization, and this isn't even one of its greatest achievements. We believe that the greatest cities and the greatest edifices are no longer standing. What they left standing was what they could explain away by saying that forced labor by a very tyrannical regime is what achieved it. Yet we can find examples all over the land where we don't have that same explanation. There is beauty, and there is something that really speaks to the interior spirit of human beings in all these edifices. And you can see that within this wonderful cathedral, it's the same thing on the interior. So what do you think? Do you believe the official historical account is correct for St. Petersburg? Or do you think that this really does show the evidence of a pre-existing civilization? Well, we're going to be looking at it a little bit more closely. Join the channel on live stream where we're going to consider resets coming up on October 7th. Well, thank you for joining me for the exploration. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, and subscribe.
Welcome, and for today's exploration, we're going to be exploring Moscow, starting with the Kremlin, Russian citadel or complex fortress in a city. We're also going to be taking a look at Moscow State University, the main building, considered by many to be the building number one in Tartarian or Old World explorations. This is one of the quintessential buildings that represents all that we explore each and every day. But there's so many more things to unlock in Russia. We even have the Bolshoi Theater. And while we're not showcasing it in this particular exploration, it will be featured in a subsequent exploration. We're going to be taking a look at some of the aspects that revolve around Moscow, reflecting many cities in the western portion of Europe and the United States. We do see similarities with the incredible architecture, the stunning achievements of arcs and columns and pillars, and of course our favorite pediments. They call Moscow the Third Rome, and perhaps that's not a appropriate sobriquet. But there's so much more to Moscow, and there's so much more to our explorations of Russia. St. Basil's Cathedral. I remember when I was a child, I used to think that St. Basil's Cathedral was actually the Kremlin itself. And I couldn't be more wrong, because St. Basil's Cathedral is not even within the Kremlin complex. It's actually located on Red Square. begin by looking at the Kremlin as an overview. What do we actually see without considering the history of it in too much detail? The Kremlin actually represents a fortress complex in Moscow. It means citadel or fortress within a city. The Kremlin was originally populated by Finnic peoples and Slavs, the official history tells us, until it was built up by Ivan III or Ivan the Great, the Grand Prince of Moscow. Prior to the family being recognized as Tsars, originally by the Habsburgs, one of the most powerful families in Europe at that time. Ivan brought in a couple architects from Italy, from the Renaissance period, and that's how the official history explains the presence of this exceptional fortress complex in Moscow. And this fortress complex is indeed very impressive. It consists of many different types of buildings within a walled compound, protected by numerous towers. Looking at the overview of the Kremlin, we see the impressiveness of this complex of many buildings protected by a wall. We have an arsenal or an armory that we'll be taking a close look at. We can also see that this series of buildings is protected by the wall and these towers, such as Troitskaya Tower, which is now the main public entrance to the Kremlin, although that was not always the case. We also see that there are several other towers, such as Spaskaya Tower, which was the original grand official entrance to the Kremlin. We also have a complex of cathedrals, many cathedrals compiled within a small area. And we have the most impressive grand palace of the Kremlin, which is currently the official residence of the Russian president. There are many different maps of the Kremlin, and sometimes it's difficult to get a sense of your bearings given how extensive this fortress complex truly is. What does this fortress complex really represent, though? What was it originally? When we look at the different depictions, we see a very large amount of very impressive buildings in a small area. It seems that, from our explorations, this represents some other sort of complex from another time and another civilization. The details and the beauty have been somehow preserved through time, many governments and many different calamities that have occurred. And no, the Russians won't call that tower a telescope, they'll actually call it a tower. And you can see next to the Grand Palace of the Kremlin and the cathedrals. The cathedrals having so many in such a small area, and we'll be looking at several of them. We'll be told that it's because of the breakdown of religious divisions, and that's why we have all these cathedrals. And we'll also be told that the entire reason for the existence of the Kremlin is because of the preference of the Grand, or the Grand Prince of Moscow, and subsequently the Tsars. We'll also be told that Ivan the Great was succeeded by Ivan the Terrible, who was the first official recognized Tsar. Not exactly a non-ominous name, Although it'd probably be a little bit more ominous if it was Ivan the Wonderful. I mean, you know, it's either the Great or the Terrible. 
Ivan's really the Russian equivalent of the name Henry when you see all the times the name Henry appears in European history. These are some of the most impressive edifices that I've seen. And we go back to our St. Petersburg exploration and we often ask the question, why is it in Russia that some of the finest examples of these older buildings have survived? And I'll admit, given my own background, I have a couple different backgrounds that one would think I would be predisposed to having a very certain feeling towards Russia as a whole. And I've learned to overlook those feelings over time because I've found that people are people. And oftentimes people have many of the same impulses, the same wondrous qualities, and the same difficult qualities that you'll find in people across the land. What was the origin of all of these incredible edifices? Every tower, every wall, every palace, every cathedral. I find it difficult to believe that it was all brought about by one monarch inviting some random architects from Renaissance Italy to come to Moscow in the cold at a time when, tra when travel was difficult, communications were challenged, and let's not even talk about logistics. Of course, we go back to the reference. Logistics are only impossible until they're not. And when there's a good explanation, you can suddenly build impressive palaces, immense cathedrals, establish walls, and produce any infinite number of bricks that you require to achieve all these stunning wonders that still stand to this day. I have to say that when it comes to a number of beautiful, extraordinary buildings compiled in a very small area, there's very little across the land that match the Kremlin. We've looked at the Tsar Bell before in the St. Petersburg exploration, and its physical location is in the Kremlin. Remember that this is the largest bell in the world. We also have a Tsar Cannon, the largest bombard in the world by caliber. Sorry, Scottish fans and Mons Meg, it's impressive, but it's not quite as large as the Tsar Cannon. We also have the bell tower of Ivan the Great. What was the original function behind all these edifices and these architectural achievements that stay with us still? These palaces that continue to garner our attention and are toured by so many every day. Yes, this is an area that is open to tourism and there is an official entrance that we'll take a look at. Even though we're told that the original function of the Kremlin was to be a fortress within a city. It was to protect the very seat of the original Russian government. And Kremlin is even synonymous with Russia as a nation and its predecessor, the Soviet Union. It's also stunning to me that all of these buildings have survived, especially the challenges of multiple world wars and even a historical period called the Time of the Troubles that was brought about due to a secession crisis after Ivan the Terrible accidentally killed his own son and his less qualified younger son had to ascend to Tsar and was quickly ousted and in a series of secession crises. We see that the Kremlin was occupied by Polish forces for two years. Once again, the difficulties of logistics, which are only impossible until they're not. There is no shortage of achievements within the Kremlin. The palaces are some of the finest palaces that you'll ever see. And off to the right here you can see the Cathedral Square, a large grouping of cathedrals, all within this small complex. The Kremlin, we're also told historically, had even more impressive buildings in the distant past. And we look at some of the older photos, and we can see that that's true to some extent. But how true it is, we don't know. We're also informed that during the communist regime in what used to be the Soviet Union, that many of these wonderful edifices were torn down to make more room. We start by looking at the Kremlin Armory, constructed in 1508, and we see a very impressive structure. And one of the things that always reaches me is just how they're able to achieve these stunning architectural achievements well before the Industrial Revolution. They managed to craft all these materials, and the answer will always be because they had all the labor that they needed, and they had all the time. Although, once again, the construction timelines on many of these buildings is very challenged. And we're reliant on a historical account that's been passed down for hundreds of years. So while it may seem like having more time offers more of an explanation to these buildings, the official history tells us that many of them were constructed in record time. We don't have the hundreds of years of timelines behind some of the cathedrals that we do in other parts of Europe. And make no mistake about it, Kremlin in Moscow is 
within Europe. We're not east of the Urals yet, which is considered the dividing line between Europe and Asia. This almost reminds me of the interior of the White Castle in the movie Kroll. Very impressive ceiling, and once again we see decorated columns, and this is within the armory itself. And we'll see the grand depictions of all the wondrous equipment used by the Russian army and the Soviet army, although this looks to be from what we think of as the medieval times, where we have plate armor. And of course we have more cannons, cast in bronze and iron. It's a unique consideration to factor together how all these weapons and all this equipment was used in that particular point in time. But even more impressive to me is that so much of it was preserved until now. I wonder if that suit of plate armor weighs between 35 to 55 pounds because that's what Google will tell us every suit of armor weighs. Very interesting when nobody considers the fact that they didn't have any kind of assembly line, except of course for that uh, Venetian arsenal to make ships that we looked at in the Vatican exploration. We see older photos though of the arsenal and older paintings and again we see no shortage of columns and pillars and architectural achievements. And remember, this is just the armory. We're not looking at any of the cathedrals or the palaces yet. And yet once again it looks as though they spared no detail even in constructing this armory or this arsenal as it's called in the official Kremlin compound. All very impressive the way it fits together. And you can see even with the columns on the pillars, this is a rather unique touch. And I really appreciate the geometric coordination within the ceiling and the stairs. Well, let's take a look at the at Spascia Tower, built 1491 by some Italian named Pietro Antonio Solari. Solari was the architect that Ivan III, or Ivan the Great, had brought in to renovate the Kremlin. Yes, most of the Kremlin as it stands now, the towers and the wall, were brought about during what was considered a renovation by Ivan III or Ivan the Great. Very, very impressive. And this is where the tower resides right now. And it's a very impressive tower as we can see. Should be noted that Solari was not hired to secede his father. So why did Ivan III want him to do the Kremlin walls and towers? Solari died in Moscow, and they brought in some other Italian guy to secede him. This is what Solari's father was the architect of, the Cathedral of Milan, a very impressive structure. But he wasn't the architect. So how did Ivan III even find out about him to bring him over to bring in the architect plans for the Kremlin? Very fascinating account. And we can see that on this tower, there is a very beautiful clock on it. Although, I should recognize the fact that instead of seeing the four ones or the four eyes, we actually see an IV, or a classic Roman numeral for four. So many bricks and so many architectural details. Done in the late 1490s, the same time that Columbus supposedly discovered America. They were building this in Moscow, Russia. And you can see that they've lifted columns high onto the tower. You can see that the clock is very impressive, and even the supposed age of some of the bricks, perhaps visible in this particular photograph. We can see that there are many details with this tower, and there's even a legend within Russia that as long as this tower stands, Moscow will not fall. For the most part, true. The only time that Moscow technically fell was to Napoleon, and that was at the decision of the city mayor or governor or the military official at the time to abandon the city to Napoleon. We'll be looking at that later this week. And we can see that along with the other towers, it is a very impressive complex. And just consider the sheer number of bricks and the logistics that went into constructing this in the 1490s. And even in the older photo, we have the usual questions. It looks like it's dirty and it's been neglected for some time, although you can still see the beauty and the enduring features of the architecture. Here's a close-up of some of the bricks and what they appear like. And this tower has a lot of meaning for the symbolism of the defense aspect of the Kremlin within Moscow, Russia. Now let's look at Troitskaya Tower, built by the next Italian, and the tallest tower of the Kremlin, 260 feet or 80 meters, and this is the main visitor's gate, as we said earlier. And again, this is another impressive tower. We can see the potential defense purposes behind it, there's no denying that. Yet it seems as though much of this entire complex, beyond being for practical defense purposes, has a symbolic feature as well. 
And you can see with all the bricks and the stones and the fine detailing within the main entrance tower to the Kremlin itself. You can also see the columns that were lifted up high and we have the usual questions because while we may not have an extended construction timeline, we still have the fact that this was constructed in the 1490s. And I have to ask the question, how exactly did they achieve it? And we'll have the usual answers. Well, they had infinite forced labor. There were no issues with producing bricks at that time. And they had an Italian architect. I mean, what more do you need to just throw up an incredible tower at the time? And numerous towers and a large walled compound. Well, you're about to see that there's a lot more than just towers and a large walled compound within the Kremlin. Starting with the Cathedral of the Annunciation, built 1484 to 1489. And this is a series of cathedrals that exist on the Kremlin, and we see what we tend to associate with Russian cathedrals, the golden onion domes. But looking closer, you can see there's a lot of fine detail on each of the towers, and a very impressive amount of detail, and again, for the late 1400s or the late 15th century. Truly an impressive edifice wherever you are in the lands and something that stands out. What's even more impressive to me is that it's existed for so long, for so many hundreds of years, and yet it retains such beauty as to almost look brand new. And this is one of the few photos of the interior that we have of it. And we can see an impressive chandelier and an almost factor of agelessness that accompanies these cathedrals. Let's take a look at the Cathedral of the Archangel, built 1505 to 1508, just a little bit later than the previous cathedral and in the same general vicinity on the Kremlin or Cathedral Square. And once again, we see that it has the same architectural stylings, all great attention paid to detail. The same type of pillars, though, integrated into the walls, extremely impressive, and the interior no less impressive. So what was really going on here? What was the original function of this very large complex and all these cathedrals built closely together? I find it difficult to believe that religious division would have all these cathedrals built in such a close area. Why not just build one very large cathedral or have a different division when it comes to buildings? There had to be some other purpose. And now Dormition Cathedral, built 1475 to 1479. And we're told that this one was actually architected by Russians, and of course all of them were built by Russians. It's just this one had an architect or architects that came from Russia. Yet it looks quite similar to the other ones. So it's really hard to say. And you can see many of the blocks that go into this. And look at the arches on the door, the multiple arches and columns, along with all the blocks. This is not something that was pulled off by people who didn't know what they were doing, or were an uneducated people, and uneducated laborers, as we're always told. There's just a sheer beauty, though, that's also found within the artwork within these buildings. And that's why we have to question this account that we're given about all of these buildings and this entire complex being done by the purposes of a monarchy and with the assistance of architects that came from different lands. Well, if they had knowledge of what architects were doing in Italy, why didn't they have knowledge of what architects were doing in Southeast Asia? Perhaps they should have invited them to come and design these stellar buildings for them. I still can't get over just how impressive this doorway is with these multiple arches and these I'll call them curved columns, with columns above them as well. I've never quite seen anything like it, and the decoration is just beyond the ability of words to describe. You can see it for yourself, though, that every little detail, artistic and structural, is expressed in this structure. And it appears in numerous old paintings and sketches, and gives us the idea that these structures have been around for hundreds of years, but who really knows how long they've actually been around for? They seem timeless, and when you consider the interiors where you have more of these structural details with very well decorated columns, and honestly these are some of the best decorated columns and walls I've seen anywhere in any of these buildings in the land, all of these cathedrals are uniquely impressive. The explanation will be, well, this, these were the cathedrals that were used by the czars and the imperial family, and that's what we went off with. Here we have Ivan the Great Bell Tower with Cathedral of the Assumption. This is the tallest structure on the Kremlin complex. No less impressive than anything else we've seen, and yet another golden onion dome with very fine details in the tower itself. Everything looks in new and impressive across the Kremlin structures. 
We also see many of the towers and turrets and unique symbols of crosses and all adorned with gold. Very intriguing. And now we move on to the Tarim Palace, built 1635 to 1636, supposedly replacing an earlier portion of it. And again, we see that in this account, much as we see it in many other cities with great edifices, that there are buildings that are built to replace the older buildings. And even though it's a longer timeline, this is supposedly the residence of the Tsarina, or the Empress, and the family. Very impressive interior, again, with arches and great decorations and large dome, or excuse me, large doors and walls. And, of course, the double-headed eagle, which is quite a paramount symbol of the Russian imperial family. Incredible pillar with that kind of decoration. Never seen anything quite like it seen things similar to it there with some of the colored windows and it's such a unique interior as well with the coloring and how everything is laid out so specifically and here we can see with some of the carpets as well and the symbolism all over the place not to be confused with symbology what's the difference between the symbolism and the symbology perhaps we're talking about symbology okay I'll drop that joke but when you see here with the windows and all the decorations that go into all the effort, I'm still thinking about who really did this and how they did it. Well, let's go to the Grand Kremlin Palace, built 1837 to 1849, the newest of the structures that we've looked at, and without a doubt, the most impressive. The Grand Kremlin Palace, here's where it's located on the overall facility of the Kremlin. It is the residence of the Russian president, or the working residence of the Russian president, as it were. And you can see that this is definitely something that far exceeds any comparison from the White House in Washington, D.C. It's been with us for a long time, or so we're told. Even during the time of the Soviet Union, where you can see the CCP that was prominently displayed in the old Grand Palace of the Kremlin, or the Kremlin Grand Palace. And in more recent times when they've replaced it with the Russian two-headed eagle. Yet on the outside we can see numerous pediments above every window, great arches, and well-decorated columns. Here's how its layout is seen from the outside of the Kremlin, with the wall and some of the cathedrals next to it that we just looked at. And you can see, even in the distance, the great tower. But it's the interior of this palace that is stunning beyond the ability of words to describe. And we recall what we saw with the Winter Palace up in St. Petersburg. And yet here we have actual photos of all of these stunning halls. And the great halls named after the five orders of Russia. All of them in their beauty and their glory. We can even see that there looks to be like a plaque that was added at some later point in time. And it's always interesting to consider how much authenticity there is with these plaques and how they relate to these buildings. Are these always there or were they just tacked on? Here you'll see the same thing that we've seen in other structures and yet even more beautifully decorated. The indentations in the ceilings, the very well decorated columns and chandeliers. The same symbol, the exploding starburst above what appears to be the throne and the well decorated pillars all across the interior of this palace. We have older photos of this palace, and we can see that its opulence was no less in times past, at least if we were to take the photos at face value, which is always questionable, but this is an edifice that you can tour to this day. Look at the floors and the chandelier, everything within the walls. Of course, the explanation will be, yes, this is a grand palace. It's supposed to be to this level of beauty, and yet I think... The interior of this building exceeds anything that we've seen so far in our explorations. This is definitely something I would fully enjoy seeing in person. The stunning layout of these halls with their decorations in the floor, the walls, and the ceiling. No detail left unturned. This is truly a transformative experience if you're just seeing this. And imagine walking in these halls every single day. I'm also trying to reconcile what it would have been for me when I was much younger and I had the preconceived notions that I did of the Soviet Union. 
Certainly no one ever showed these kind of interiors from the Grand Palace in any sort of educational upbringing that I had or any of the news programs that I watched ever give us the indication that something like this would exist within the Soviet Union in the early 1980s or the late 1970s in the United States. This certainly defies everything that we believe about a given account. When we look at buildings like this, though, we have to question what we're told about anything like this being built in the 19th century by anybody across the lands. There is something that is truly extraordinary beyond the ability of words to describe. You can see it, and you can feel it. And imagine walking in and through it every day and seeing all the fine geometry, the incredible artistic inspiration that's displayed and reflected in every decoration, in every wall, near every window, in every chandelier. This is by far and away the finest interior I have seen in these explorations. And we've seen some incredible ones, whether we're looking at a basilica or other palaces. And I have a feeling this is a lot of what we're missing that we couldn't really see in full detail in the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. And here it is, in the Grand Palace on the Kremlin. Stunning beauty and detail with the symbols that have endured all these years. Well, let's take a look at the Tsar Canyon, large bombard by caliber in the world, cast in bronze in 1586. Now, we recall we saw, I'm trying to remember the exact name of it, the large bombard in Edinburgh Castle when we explored Edinburgh. But here we have what is defined as the largest bombard in the world. No practicality, no military application behind it, impossible to move. There are indications, we're told by official accounts, that it's been fired at least once, although who knows what's true behind that or not. Could it have had a different function? What do you think it could have been if it indeed did have a different function? Let me know in the comments. Every time I see one of these bombards or these cannons and you consider the practicality of moving it in the ammunition, what was really the purpose behind building it? And of course, we'll be told it was just to showcase the abilities at the time, cast it in bronze to show how large we can make it. Because obviously we had no other concerns at that time, you know, except for this little thing called the Troubles and the Secession Crisis and numerous wars. And let's compare and contrast uh, everything we've seen with the State Kremlin Palace, our finest brutalist architecture from 1961. Yes, this is what we'd come to expect from the Soviet Union. Oddly enough, it's also exactly what we'd come to expect from the United States in the 1950s and the 1960s. This could be any sort of city hall that we've seen in the United States or a more modern county courthouse. It looks exactly like it. And here we have uh, Lenin's tomb, another very fine brutalist architecture tomb for Vladimir Lenin, and it would make a very fitting tomb for any former U.S. president, I have no doubt. Now let's look at St. Basil's Cathedral, built 1555 to 1561. And as I said earlier, this is what I always associated with the Kremlin, and for the longest time I thought it was the Kremlin, but in reality it's a cathedral. One of the most impressive, beautiful, and colorful cathedrals I think we've seen. And this is always associated with Russia and the former Soviet Union. This incredible edifice shows something that I don't think we've seen in a cathedral before with how colorful it is, how beautiful, and yet it was built in the 16th century. And look at some of the details with this, the combination of the bricks, the different coloring within the tower. You have every architectural touch expressed in this one building. Very impressive, and here you can see in this older photo, you're missing the colors, but you can see that all the architectural detailing was there. And once again, we ask, how old was this really? This was actually done in the 16th century? Ah, uh, President Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev having a little discussion. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall, and can we borrow some of your bricks? We're all out of bricks in St. Louis. The interior is just stunning as well, much as many of these other buildings. And we can see that here we have the old wooden doors and every single decoration on the ceilings, the walls, and you just look at the arches and how they've decorated everything. It's not just the structure, but also how it's painted. This truly feels like something from another world, another time, another civilization, and I don't think there's any debating that. Well, let's look at Moscow State University, main building, built 1947 to 1953, 239 meters, 784 feet tall, tallest building in Europe until 1990, tallest educational building in the world as of today. This is considered one of the 
fundamental buildings that's used in Tartarian or Old World research. And we can see why. Yet we're told that this was constructed after World War II. Yet when we look at this building, we have what we would no doubt refer to as Art Deco architecture in structures we looked at in the United States, especially right there above all of these columns. So what's the real story behind this building? Was this indeed a building that was built by the Soviet Union at the end of World War II? Well, I guess if there's one thing that's reflex reflective about communism is the fact that it seems to generate a lot of currency, or at least some form of currency. The official account tells us that the Soviet Union was devastated by World War II, vast civilian and military casualties, having to relocate entire industries, and yet, not a few short years at the end of that conflict, they were able to build this stunning edifice. Why would anybody be concerned about Sputnik in the United States if the Soviet Union was able to achieve this? And let me remind you, the United States was not building buildings like this after World War II. They had stopped, well before World War II, building Art Deco. And yet it looks like they achieved one in the Soviet Union. When we look at the top, we're certainly reminded of some of the design stylings that we saw in the Power and Light District in Kansas City when we looked at several of the larger buildings there. But this is an educational building. And there's no educational building like this across the lands. This is still the tallest one. And the tallest until a building in Germany exceeded it in Europe. Very impressive interiors as well with columns and everything else arrayed with it. So I'm just trying to reconcile exactly how this was achieved. Or are we not given the actual official account? Is there more of a story to this building? I'm reminded of the questions that we have about that hotel constructed in North Korea. Now, am I just saying that because this building was built in a communist nation? No, absolutely not. You know, communism needs currency and the capitalist democratic system in the United States needs very large government programs and social welfare programs to operate. It's just one of those things. But you look inside this building and you see there has to be a much deeper story. And as I was looking at it, I wondered if there were construction photos available, and I searched feverishly for them. Well, we have the digging of a very large hole, although it doesn't seem to be a large enough hole for the foundation, but we're told that this is the foundation photo for constructing the building in the 1940s. We do have what appear to be some construction photos showing the building in the background. Although, interesting enough, we see that they look very similar to the older construction photos we recall seeing at the start of the 20th century in many of the buildings that we've looked at in the United States. I'm sure, once again, that is just merely a coincidence. You can see that with all this modern Soviet machinery and this colorized photo, I wonder if this was colorized by some kind of artificial intelligence program, that it's clear that they really constructed this building that we shouldn't be asking any questions about it. And when you see this very convincing photo with a backdrop that kind of reminds me of uh, many Star Trek episodes and I can't figure out why it would, you can tell that this is a legitimate, genuine construction effort. Now, I'm just talking about the photos. I don't know about the actual history of the building. Maybe there's somebody out there who could let me know in the comments section that they know of somebody or their great-great-grandfather actually participated in constructing this building. I know I'm going back a little ways, but it's an impressive edifice, and I don't think we've seen anything quite like it. And we're definitely going to have to look into it a little bit more. Well, thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restitutor Orbis channel, and today we're going to be exploring the mysteries of Siberia is something that captures our imagination for a variety of reasons. It's very interesting to consider the fact that Siberia is not often discussed directly in historical studies, despite the fact that many of the known lands encompass Siberia. 
and there's a very definitive question as to why this is. When we think of Siberia, our minds go to an imagination of wondrous mountains and cold frozen tundras. And for people who are into studying World War II and the communist regime, they think of the terrifying gulags. Yet there's much more extensive aspect to Siberia than what may reach the mind. For one, it's the mere size of this geographical area. It's also the fact that there are many coincidences when it comes to Siberia. In fact, if you look up coincidence and what you actually observe in Siberia, well, they should probably add it to the dictionary. Naturally, they won't. Very stunning rock formations that do not match simple explanation. Although our esteemed scientists and historians will tell us there is a natural explanation for all of these rock formations, and there is nothing mysterious at all about Siberia. In this exploration, we're going to take a different look at the perspectives of some of these rock formations. We're also going to consider how Siberia relates to our studies of the old world and previous civilizations. The mainstream does acknowledge that there are previous civilizations in Siberia, but of course they have a very different perspective of them than what we're going to be looking at today. Well, let's begin our exploration going down the cold and frozen road to learn the truth of Siberia. Let's begin by taking a look at Siberia and Russia. Now, we just explored Moscow earlier this week, and we see that Moscow is on the western end of this vast tract of land. Now, how large is Siberia? Well, depending on the exact source, you'll see anywhere from 4.9 to 5 million square miles. How exactly large is that? Well, Siberia, as you can see, comprises the vast amount of territory of the Russian Federation. Or for comparison, it is one-third larger than the entire land area of the United States and one-fourth larger than the entire land area of Canada. And looking at that, you can see why that's true. We also have a very suspicious area here that looks like that it's been bombed out or subjected to some terrific forces. Now, of course, we'll have the scientific explanation that'll tell us that this is because of the extreme cold, this is from some sort of permafrost or erosion, the usual culprits when we look at land areas such as this. However, I find such a land area very suspicious because it does look like it's been struck by something from the air, but perhaps, as we always say, it's just a coincidence. Anyone can see, though, that this is a vast tract of land, and it comprises a very large area. In fact, nearly one-tenth of all the lands in the known world are in Siberia. Looking at the Urbano Monte map from 1587, we can see that he did depict lands up at the North Pole. And in our recent explorations, to include St. Petersburg and Moscow, we can see potentially how a pre-existing civilization that may have started in those lands could have expanded and reached the northern areas of what is now Russia. And in fact, we can see here the northern area of Siberia. A lot of questions and a lot of coincidences that seem to arise with this. Now, looking at many other maps, we'll see that the area is oftentimes listed as Tartaria. And the mainstream tells us that this is actually just Greater Tartary, that there was never any such nation called Tartaria. Well, I'm going to say on this particular exploration, it really doesn't matter what it was called. What matters is the fact that we're talking about a vast tract of land that has pre-existing civilizations associated with it, which the mainstream acknowledges, and we're going to be looking at that. Looking overall at Siberia, though, we can see that this vast tract of land that is larger than the United States and larger than Canada has different components to it. We have the West Siberian Plain, which is just east of the Ural Mountains. Now, the traditional definition of the divide between Asia and Europe is said to be the Ural Mountains. There are some other sources that will tell you it's other mountains, and maybe we just need to have Superman fly down there and verify where the fault line actually is. It's one gigantic landmass. That's the important thing. The Siberian Plateau in central Siberia. And then here in northeast Siberia with the Kamchatka Peninsula. Always an area that was known historically because this is where it bordered near Alaska. But there's just so many lands and so many different rivers and unexplored areas. We'll be assured that it is explored. And when I said earlier that there's not much of a historical association, it always feels as though the studies of history tend to dance around Siberia. You'll hear little references to it in the railroad and the main route, and people always talked about people as in historians, official historians, if you want to call them that. 
They would always discuss the Siberian route and how critical and strategic it was, especially during conflicts of the past and the old Silk Road and the trade route. And you can see why Moscow would be such a strategic city looking at that route. Well, we start by looking at the beautiful Lena Pillars. These pillars are all 150 to 300 meters or 490 to 980 feet high. This runs along the Lena River. We will be told, in fact, we will be assured ad nauseum by our scientists, our geologists, that this is a natural rock formation. And it's quite a puzzling enigma to begin the exploration with because when you look at all these rock formations, you can't help but realize just how uniform they are. Why exactly are they referred to as pillars? Well, you probably get an explanation if you ask a geologist. It's because they look like pillars. And when you look at how extensive and how far this goes on the Lena River, you can't help but realize that these are pillars. And these formations appear at various places for miles and miles. Yet looking a little bit more closer at them, we see a more fine geometrical symmetry to them. What is really going on here? And as if you need any more suspicion to this Lena pillar area, consider the fact that this is also a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And looking here at this chart, we can see the number of UNESCO World Heritage Sites that are registered each year, supposed to have cultural significance. Why exactly does a natural rock formation have cultural significance? In fact, in my mind, this is even more suspicious than if they just said that this was a large golf course. Although, looking at this very well-shaped rock pillar that was formed naturally, consider how difficult a game of golf might be if you're trying to tee off on the top of that. The thing that I find surprising, though, looking at these pillars is just how uniform they are. And also consider that their height has a very unique coincidence to it. And once again, if you're going to accept the fact that this is a natural rock formation, you also have to accept the fact that there are many coincidences that are associated with it. Now, what exactly am I referring to? Well, you look at the fine structure behind these pillars. There's the fact that they call them pillars. And no matter what angle you look at them from, you have to overlook the fact that erosion is supposed to leave things in a fine rounded shape. Well, it only does until it's not supposed to and there's always exceptions to every rule. And I understand that. But is there any other place in the land that you're going to see pillars that are formed like this? Pillars that are formed by natural forces that look like pillars to this extent. We've done other explorations where we've questioned what we see in buildings that we know were very clearly made by artificial means. And yet looking at these pillars, we're told that these are natural. Also consider what they tell us that these pillars are made out of. They tell us that these pillars are made primarily out of limestone. And of course, there are some other stones that they say are factored into it. But looking at them a little more holistically, we see that actually examining these in person, I wonder what kind of material, what kind of composition we'd find. And I'm not some person to rely on some filter card machine to tell me exactly what the composition of a building material is. I prefer to actually get on the ground and examine it. And I have to say, I've added the Lena pillars to my areas that I would like to do an on-site exploration of. Because when you look at this, there's just too many fine details to simply write off as coincidence. Now, do I know exactly what happened? Can I say beyond any shadow of a doubt that I know what the origin of these Lena pillars truly are? No, I don't. But I think it's interesting, and there's far too many coincidences to simply overlook this as a natural rock formation. How much uniformity do you truly need to at least want to go and explore something a little bit closer? And what really is the cultural heritage with it? Is this just an area in Siberia where people go by on riverboats and they say, look, there's the Lena Pillars. We're not actually going to get off, although it does look like the boat tour allows you to get off and explore them a little bit more closely. It's a very intriguing rock formation. And it's more than a coincidence in the fact that there's a vast amount of limestone that they say is in this rock formation. It's also more than a coincidence concerning the uniformity of these so-called pillars, especially when you look at them from the top down. Once again, we see many vertical lines that are very straight. Well, I guess it just flies right in the face of the old saying that God does not build in straight lines. I guess according to scientists, while God may not build in straight lines, natural forces build in very straight lines. And they build in great uniform straight lines, which go along for miles of a river. Hmm, what else do we know that's along rivers? Oh yeah, they prefer to park cities on rivers for some reason. 
I guess it has something to do with logistics and transportation and those sort of mentalities that only apply when we're told they apply. But what do you make of the Lena Pillars? What exactly do you make of this very puzzling rock formation? Let me know in the comments. And as always, I'm open to all perspectives. I'll point out one more coincidence. When you consider the average height of skyscrapers from the 1890s, when we're told that the skyscraper was innovated and implemented, consider what the ideal and usable height of a skyscraper is. And we'll be told that it's anywhere from 300 to 900 feet. Now, we do have taller skyscrapers, such as the Burj Khalifa or Burj Khalifa. Yes, Dr. Davidson, I'm thinking of you. When you see the fact that a lot of this, though, is considered unusable space in these skyscrapers. In fact, the usable height from the skyscrapers just happens to correspond with the height of the Lena Pillars. Now, that's one significant coincidence, I think. Also, consider the fact that every single Lena Pillar, add that up as a separate coincidence, is the ideal usable height of a skyscraper. And isn't it interesting here that uh, our great forces of authority are telling us that these are considered vanity heights for these skyscrapers. There's a lot of the Burj Khalifa that you can't actually use because it's just too tall, along with many other buildings. Unless, of course, you plan to provide rental space to a group of wasps. And you allow the wasps to build their nests up there, and I'm sure wasps have a good AAA credit rating. And perhaps that's why they built the vanity height on these buildings. So it's quite a coincidence. How many coincidences total do you think there are with the Lena Pillars? Let me know in the comments. Or is it all just a natural formation? The Gornia Shoria Megalis, another natural formation. A rock formation that of course has theories in terms of how it formed. Scientists and geologists will assure us that these are a natural rock formation. Prior to going into this exploration though of the so-called Megalis, let's take a look at Baalbek back in Lebanon. Now we know, and the mainstream confirms beyond any shadow of a doubt, that this is an artificial site. The Romans supposedly quarried these incredible stones and built this Temple of Jupiter in Baalbek, Lebanon. And we have verification that this is an artificial site from the mainstream. Well, let's take a look at the Megalus in Gornia Shoria, back in Siberia. And when you look on the top, you can see what appears to be a very extensive wall structure. Now I know, that's my imagination running wild. We are assured by our mainstream account that this is a natural rock formation. And as you can see, it's another natural rock formation that has a lot of very defined horizontal lines in it. And I'm sure that this is the causes of erosion and that this has been the natural effects that happen all this time. Once again, while God may not build in straight lines, Science most certainly can build in straight lines in a natural format. And here you can get an idea for just the size of this rock formation. And it's very impressive that however these megaliths or rocks were formed, that they seem to hold together so well and they have such a structural integrity with them, especially with not just fine horizontal lines, but these ones also have very suspicious vertical lines, or perhaps I should just say very peculiar vertical lines within these very large stones. Now, of course, what the mainstream will tell us is that the very suggestion that these megaliths are artificial is merely a fringe thought. It's always a fringe theory because they will tell us. Now, while no one in the mainstream actually saw exactly how these formed, you just have to go with your intuition and realize that what you're looking at is a natural formation. It's a very impressive natural formation. And I have to say, some of these lines are far more straight and far more precise than anything that we'd see in artificial formation. So perhaps the conclusion we can take from this is that these natural rock formations have to be natural because the vertical and horizontal lines are far more precise than what we'd have in an artificial construction. Once again, this is another site that I would like to get to and explore in person because as I said earlier, I don't rely on any kind of Feldercarb technology to tell me exactly what the composition of the material is. I would like to verify that for myself. But we can see that the structural strength of these megaliths has to be something beyond what would normal forces be subjected to. And why is that? Because we're told that this structure, excuse me, this natural rock formation has stood the test of time. And of course, we'll be told that it's for millions of years. Millions of years of natural weathering and erosion that 
forms these very precise and exceptional lines that we see in this formation. Now, you can accept the scientific explanation. You can realize that they have to utilize theories to explain how this formed. And of course, the perception of how they make those theories is certainly not intellectual cheetah flips. I recall having many discussions with geologists in my past life about how many of these rock formations formed. And they always seem to be going back and forth on what the theory is. Well, is it some sort of use of rock? Is it some sort of spheroidal forces? Yes, they'll come up with new words that they seem to innovate on the fly to come up with theories for how these rock formations are truly formed. And I'm not going to go so far as to suggest that this is an artificial formation because I'll let you look at the images and come to your own conclusions. Is it artificial? Is that just a fringe theory? Or is it truly natural as we're told? This is one of many sites in Siberia. We're only really looking at two today, and there are many more. There are many more megaliths, and there are many more pillars to be seen across Siberia. But if you accept the fact that there might be a possibility that these could be artificially formed, then what sort of force would it have taken to cut and move these blocks? Now we admit that the blocks at Baalbek and Lebanon were cut artificially and moved, but these, of course, were formed by natural processes. And I know I'm emphasizing that quite extensively, but you have to recall that this is exactly what we're told by the mainstream account. They have to emphasize it. They have to come up with theories that they constantly change for how these rocks formed. And that's exactly what they do. So when you look at them and when you consider all of these theories for how these natural rock formations formed, you realize that it feels as though the account is constantly changing. And what does that tell you about the validity of an account if it's constantly changing? And the fact that the mainstream is trying to come up with theories to explain this. It means they do not have an explanation. It means that there could be another explanation for the formation of these megaliths. Now, does this mean that all of society came from Siberia originally? could be possible. It could also mean that they're the remnants of a previous civilization that existed in Siberia. Now, what kind of civilization would possess the capability to do something like this? To actually cut, form, and move stone of this size. And who knows if this was stone originally, perhaps this was something else. But again, another series of questions and just a lot of theories. There's also many different entrance points that you can't help but realize look artificial. And I find it fascinating that the series of theories oftentimes seems to be revolving from whether it's the work of water, whether it's the work of seismic forces that just happen to form all these very fine vertical and horizontal lines within these stones. And there we have this gentleman again here pointing out these stones again. Well, I've got to say, I'd probably call this guy before I'd call Jeremiah Johnson. I think he'd be a much more trustworthy survivalist guide than Robert Redford if you're stuck out in the Siberian wilderness. It's another thing to consider is just how vast Siberia is. And yet in the middle of it, in these vast lands, you have these extraordinary rock formations. Rock formations that just happen to have very fine vertical and horizontal lines cut in them by what scientists will tell us are natural forces, whether it's erosion, water, or seismic forces, or some combination of some unique word that you haven't heard before that's been innovated to explain a theory. This is one of my favorite ones here with this little tower. Yes, I'm just trying to ponder the natural forces that would have formed a tower of rock like this. It's quite an extraordinary explanation. And then going back to what we saw in Baalbek, you don't see any consistencies, do you? And yes, my sarcasm meter has turned up to 10 once again. Because in the large stones and works of Baalbek, and you'll also see other sites that look like quarries across the land, you just simply can't explain this away by saying there's a rational, natural, scientific explanation for it. I mean, you can, but at some point, are you really just willing to accept whatever you're told because that's easier? as opposed to being naturally inquisitive, which I will say is a natural human trait, to figure out exactly what happened here? Or do you suppress it? Do you just accept what their explanation is? Instead of being able to operate in an area of ambiguity or ambivalence towards what the real origin of this is. I do admit that this could be a natural formation. 
Do I think that's very likely? What I'm seeing does not indicate that it is very likely. That is a lot of coincidence again. Add up the number of coincidences, just like we did with the Lena pillars. How many coincidences do you get for the formation of every straight, vertical, and horizontal line? And then you add up all the coincidences of both these sites together. And keep in mind, we're only looking at two sites in Siberia. I assure you, there are plenty more that we can explore. Now let's take a look at some of the artifacts within Siberia. We're told by the mainstream that there was a very stunning Bronze Age civilization that was in Siberia. And the artifacts prove it. This is a very interesting figure that I've never quite seen before. And it's an intriguing aspect. Now, could this archaeological... The whole concept of archaeology is intriguing. Now, I can't verify that these artifacts were dug up in Siberia. We're assured that they are. And the research that I did says that these are all artifacts from a Bronze Age civilization. And if they are true, it's very impressive, some of the fine detailing that you have on them. It's also interesting to note that the mainstream does indicate that there was a previous civilization that existed in Siberia. And of course, they'll tell us that it was a Bronze Age civilization. Now, let's recall that the pyramids, we're told by the mainstream, was constructed during the Bronze Age. So, if they were to admit that the megaliths that we just looked at earlier were an artificial formation, they'd have to confabulate some sort of elaborate explanation for how they managed to build those megaliths. Perhaps they brought in a lot of water and floated all the stones in place. And they cut them, and people spent generations and generations of cutting the stones. Looking at some of the artifacts, though, you do see some impressive touches this is a very intriguing creature. And what exactly is this supposed to represent here? Also the fine workmanship on this, if this is in fact a legitimate artifact. Now you'll ask the question, all right, Aurelian, why are we looking at artifacts that may or may not be legitimate? It's always interesting to consider what the mainstream account tells us, because it seems clear that there are a lot of hints that are given in the mainstream account. And yet at the same time, we're also given conflicting information, conflicting theories. So it feels as though a lot of what we're presented is legitimate, and there is a lot of aspects that we can verify on-site. It's one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of on-site explorations. You'll even see that they claim to have found what was a very developed and very interesting warrior. They say this was a woman who was wearing some very elaborate jewelry in this account, and that they, jug they dug up this jewelry, and it seems to be that it still fits quite fine to this day. Now... Here's a person modeling the jewelry. Does this look like something that some sort of Bronze Age civilization would be able to form and do just like this? Well, I guess if you believe that the pyramids were constructed, as we're told, in a Bronze Age, then yes, anything was really possible. And maybe the question we should be asking is, how exactly far has the capability of humanity fallen since the Bronze Age? But of course, we don't simply accept that explanation on this channel. We look for other explanations and other theories. Now, was this really just a burial? Was this just some random skeleton that they found and looked at the site and then decided to associate that story with this? It's all entirely possible. That's always a thing when you're looking at archaeological sites. Yet some of the worksmanship that you see on this seems as though it's beyond the imagination of somebody to contrive in this day and age. Because we see a bit more of something that shows a creative inspiration and something that seems a little bit closer to the genuine human spirit was some of the artwork. So I suspect that a lot of it may be legitimate. Yeah, stone tools that look very advanced. There's almost a modern component to this, especially looking at that dagger. Now, is that just my imagination running wild? If these were tools that were from a previous civilization, what forces have they been subjected to over time? Well, let's look at the most alluring mystery of Siberia. Tunguska event. Through a fisheye lens, we have an account that a meteor, and I recall the original account being a comment, struck, or didn't strike Siberia, but exploded in the atmosphere above it. It's funny how this account seems to have changed many times over the years, but I know scientists are always exploring and looking at it. This is the exact location in Siberia of where the so-called Tunguska event occurred back in 1908, so at the start of the 20th century. 
Now, there's a lot of explanations given for it, and here's the official account. The Tunguska event devastated 770 square miles of forest in Siberia near the Tunguska River on June 30th, 1908. The blast power is estimated to be equal to 30 megatons of TNT. We'll look at that in a second. Knocked down 80 million trees, created a quake that was a 5-0 on the Richter scale. Despite having 1,000 times the energy of an atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima, no impact crater. The true cause remains a mystery. And this shows the effect of the area. And it also shows the effect of this earthquake that was 5.0 on the Richter scale. Another interesting thing to consider is that uh, the official authorities and the scientists at that time didn't actually get in to look at this until nearly 20 years later. Don't you find that interesting? There are many different accounts on the ground of what the very sparse population saw in Siberia. The sky split in two, fire appeared high and wide over the forest, couldn't bear it, shirt was on fire, then trees were falling, branches were on fire, became mighty bright, and it's as if there was a second sun. Where have we heard that explanation before or description of such a sight? Now, it's gone back and forth if it actually impacted. We're assured that no object impacted. I recall when I originally entered academia that they thought this was a comet and a comet that exploded in the atmosphere. Well, now they've changed it to a meteor. Now, this is not an actual photo from what happened. It's an interpretation, but something else to be aware of. The event was also observed from Northern Ireland at an observatory, and that was well over 3,500 miles away from Tunguska. And they said that it left a nocturnal glow that you could still read a newspaper at after midnight. So what was really going on here with this Tunguska event? Was this really an exploding meteorite, as we're told? And of course, what the scientific expedition on the ground found was there were trees that were flattened, but they couldn't find an impact crater. So you would think that indicates an airburst detonation. But what if there was an entirely different explanation for this Tunguska event? What if this was some sort of piece of old technology that had been set off at that time? Destructive technology that was designed to level what remained of any civilization to be found within Siberia. Another thing I always find interesting is the strategic importance of Moscow. Going back to the Napoleonic Wars, there's a conflicting account as to what the actual capital of Imperial Russia was. It was Moscow. No, it was St. Petersburg. Both cities that we've looked at in explorations. Yet you could say that Moscow is really the gateway to Siberia. What's actually in Siberia that is so critical? Why is it that in historical circles, direct discussion of Siberia seems to be avoided? We're talking about 10% of the entire land. And just to give you an idea of what 30 megatons is, on the right there you see the Tsar Bomba, Tsar Bomba, which is the largest nuclear device ever detonated, and to the left of it Castle Bravo, the largest US nuclear device ever detonated. So 30 megatons is somewhere between those two on the right. What kind of force would that be? And of course we're not questioning the validity of nuclear weapons in this exploration. We're assuming that they are very valid. This is a photo of the Tsar Bomba from the plane that dropped it. Supposedly the shock wave from this 50 megaton bomb circled the entire world three times. And of course this was definitely a fear weapon and it goes along with what we're told is the Russian preference to have the largest anything. So of course it'd be the Tsar Bomba like the Tsar Cannon. One of the things I always wondered, though, is those Russians could really build a great camera. I mean, imagine the forces that this camera had to be subjected to in the shockwave that circled the entire planet three times, or so we're told, the planet. But what was really going on with this Tunguska event? 30 megatons is not too far off from that Tsar Bomba. Yes, it's just over 50% of the yield, but still, that's an incredible detonation. And there's other more modern theories that recently seem to have cropped up that say that this meteorite didn't actually strike anything, it bounced off the atmosphere, and then it just simply went back up into the sky. What a likely story. What kind of device, uh, excuse me, what kind of natural meteorite just happens to fly down when it's being pulled by the very incredible force of gravity, which scientists assure us exist, and it could just simply bounce off after causing a massive airburst detonation. And here's a depiction of it. Yes, it just flew close to the surface of the Earth and projected some sort of force to level the land, causing a 30 megaton detonation. To be fair, it's an estimate. They say it's 8 to 30 megatons, but on the high side, 30 megatons. What exactly was going on with this Tunguska event? So many anomalies with it, and this is what it looks like today. You still see that there's an area where the trees don't grow. You have to consider, though, that perhaps the on-site accounts were 
Not exactly accurate. But then you consider what happened at the observatory in Ireland, where they say there was an eerie glow that you could read a newspaper at night. What kind of force or device or whatever actually causes that? Where the entire sky was lit up to a glow that illuminated the sky, and they say there was no moon at that time, and there was no natural illumination that would enable that. What was really the intention, or what really happened in Siberia? This just adds to the mystery of this vast tract of land, and when I say that historians tend not to talk about it, there's only some very peripheral historical events that even seem to occur around Siberia. It's not to say that Siberia doesn't have a history. You've got some scattered accounts of various do-gooders from the West who went to Siberia to try to bring healing for people, various doctors and nurses and other missionaries that went through the area. But yet the official history of it always seems to be glossed over for a variety of reasons. And how accurate were these photos? Because remember, the scientific, scientific expedition didn't get there until nearly 20 years after the fact. So in conclusion, what do we have in Siberia, and what do I think we have? Well, we look at our five eras theory, and we consider where Siberia falls into that, because Siberia seems to be something that indicates a previous civilization. Perhaps we're looking at the remnants of the Tartarian era, or the fourth era, the civilization that preceded ours, that are very clear, especially in the Lena Pillars. Now, could they be much older? Of course they could. But they seem to have a uniformity to them that is very impressive. And imagine if that really was the remnants of a city that was subjected to some terrifying forces. It had to be some sort of extraordinary advanced civilization. And what about the megaliths? Well, perhaps something from the foundation areas, the earlier eras that we believe that we built subsequent civilizations to include the civilization that preceded ours on top of. And then, of course, you had the Tunguska event that occurred in the contemporary era. Something that was either artificial or a natural event that wiped out, destroyed a lot of what remains, a lot of the evidence. But what do you think of all this? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome, and today we're going to be exploring the Silk Road, an old world trade route that runs all the way through Asia up to what is now Istanbul. The Silk Road is quite an intriguing aspect when we look at the route and the major cities that exist off the route. We'll find that there are many allusions to the old world in these great cities. For those of you who are new to this channel, I'm going to leave a link in the description in terms of our grand theories of what the channel proposes. For today, this is going to be primarily a showcase of this stunning architecture that exists along the route of the Silk Road, or the Silk Route, that existed in the first century. Looking at the Silk Road, we can see that it runs all the way from China bisecting Asia from east to west, and then ending up at what is today Istanbul. And when the Silk Road started, this was Constantinople, originally a major city of the Roman Empire, and then subsequently the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, or Byzantium as it was called by historians, even though it was never referred to that by contemporaries at the time. Constantinople, an intriguing city that became Istanbul, and we'll be taking a close look at it. We'll be following the route from Constantinople through what is now Syria, and we have explored Palmyra before, to Baghdad, Iraq, and we'll be taking a close look at Baghdad. When we look at how extensive the route is, we have to consider the terrain that it passed through and the time frame that we're told that it did. 
These were supposedly caravans that traveled for months and even years back and forth along this route to bring silk from China all the way to Constantinople and ultimately into Europe. We're going to be taking a close look at the city of Mashhad in northeastern Iran, and then the old city of Merv, or at least the ruins of it. These were major cities that existed on the Silk Road. It's intriguing to consider that the Silk Road runs like a circuit cable from China all the way to Constantinople at the time and into Europe, much in the same way that the fictional Nung River ran through Vietnam to allow Captain Willard to reach Colonel Kurtz in his journey in the film Apocalypse Now. There's another interesting aspect when we look at the Silk Road, and this is what it looked like in the first century Common Era, as they call it. The land route that ran through the vast tracts of arid terrain, the many deserts and various high elevations. It had to be very challenging to get camels and horses and whatever else they had with wagons to transport this, silk. Silk was what really drove the Silk Road, taking it from China to every other location in the known lands at that time. I find it interesting that they were able to keep an active trade route going, and there are other accounts that they had sea routes going at that time in the first century, and the Silk Road was very active all the way up until about the 15th or 16th century, depending on what source you look at, which is really about the time that the Renaissance was in full swing in Europe. And some sources would say that it was the connections brought about by the Crusades and reconnecting Europe to the lost civilization of antiquity. Well, let's begin by looking at Istanbul, the city formerly known as Constantinople. Istanbul, or Constantinople, has a very deep history to it, and it's well documented that this was originally a major city of Hellenistic culture, the meeting point or nexus between Rome and Greece. And it would also be the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire until the Western Roman Empire fell. And then Constantinople remained as the capital of the Roman Empire until it too fell to the Ottomans in the 15th century. So the official history says. We have a lot of very intriguing and unique structures that exist. The least of which are the fortifications of Constantinople, the so-called Theodosian Walls. Very thick walls that enabled the city to survive many sieges. The city was constantly under a state of siege from other powers, or so we're told, and it even consists of this unique cistern that exists underneath the Hagia Sophia, the main temple that was originally built by Christians and then converted into a mosque once the Ottomans captured the city. The cistern was even featured in the movie From Russia with Love, with Sean Connery starring as James Bond. Remember when James Bond actually seemed to enjoy what he did and wasn't always depressed? Okay, back on topic. The cisterns are very unique, and they show us very well-built pillars and arches underground where water runs. And this is exactly where the cistern is laid out in conjunction with the Hagia Sophia and the Hippodrome. And we can see that there were a lot of different architectural stylings and unique aspects that were employed to build this city. We have many different renderings or paintings of what it looked like in the distant past, and we can see it may have appeared more Roman, but is that really the way it appeared, or is that just the way that we're shown that it appeared? Like I've always said, this channel considers all accounts, and we do consider the fact that the historical account may be accurate. However, Constantinople is one of the cities in the past before it became Istanbul that seems to tell a very different story. A story that conflicts with what we're told in the historical account, because we do see older type of buildings that we seem to be concealing with newer buildings. The Hagia Sophia, for example. We're told that originally this was a Christian building, and it was converted into a mosque once the Ottomans conquered Constantinople and renamed it Istanbul. We have a painting of what it likely looked at, but looked like before the minarets were added. A very unique dome with wonderful details behind it. When you look a little more closely, though, at a lot of the building material in Istanbul, what used to be Constantinople, you can see that it almost looks as though it's been subjected to some sort of terrific forces in many places. And you have to ask the question, how old are a lot of these stone layouts? How old is that cistern? Yes, we have an idea of when it was built and when these columns were built, and you can even see it in the movie From Russia with Love, where uh, James Bond's host even tells him. Looking at the walls and seeing the fine bricks and detail that went into this construction, it's very impressive, and we're told this was a fine fortification that defended the city. 
Going back to the cistern, though, you can also see that there seems to be the same kind of brick construction that goes into the many arches that are supported by these columns. This is very impressive construction. And then, of course, we look at another one of these paintings and renderings where we see more of the Roman flavor, if you will, of what used to be Constantinople. Again, seeing more domes, and of course we're told that dome equaled Roman or Greek at the time. Going back to the walls, you can also see that a lot of the blocks maintain their original appearance, and it seems as though there's been little renovation done on these walls over the years. Going back to the cistern, it also consists of many strange statues and depictions, and this is supposed to be a statue of Medusa's head that's upside down as part of this column. Very intriguing as to what that represents. Looking at this rendering of the Hippodrome, or this painting, and we can see some of the other Roman architecture and how it may have appeared. Once again, though, we have to question the accuracy of this account, because there's other drawings and renderings that show this portion of a ruined Hippodrome, and we have an obelisk and columns, and other smaller obelisks and columns. So what was really going on? Here's what the Hagia Sophia looks like today, now that it's been converted into a mosque with the many minarets added. And another question I have is, were those minarets indeed added, or were they part of the original structure? The walls also maintain their parapets, and what we're told officially is how the city was able to survive for so long, even though Constantinople existed in a state of siege. Well, let's go from Constantinople to Baghdad, proceeding south and southeast on the Silk Road. Baghdad is an intriguing city that was originally built around the Kadamiya Mosque, or so we're told. Baghdad was originally known as the Round City, and it was considered very advanced for its time. We have many different renderings, depictions, paintings, and sketches that show Baghdad being an extremely advanced city. A holy site for the Shia sect of Islam, and this was the origin of the entire city of Baghdad. Called the Round City, and yet we see that... Many of the impressive examples of architecture continue to endure to this day. A series of mosques and many other supporting structures across Baghdad give it the indication that this once was a very magnificent city. Here's a closer look at the Kadamiya Mosque as it exists today in all its glory, still at the center of the Kadamiya district in Baghdad and the center of the original round city of Baghdad. We also see that there's many other impressive examples of architecture in Baghdad, whether it's a tomb, it's a shrine, it's a mosque. We have many great, well-decorated towers with unique blocks. And yet it's been unfortunate that Baghdad has been subjected to many conflict over the decades. We see that uh, it's very impressive that many of these structures have survived all this different external and internal forces that have provided physical danger to these buildings. Yet many of them survive, bearing wondrous domes and minarets and incredible detailed arches that have been constructed on the buildings. The original round city of Baghdad was quite an impressive layout in and of itself. A unique grid pattern based on a circle. Something that seems to reflect a, an old world architecture. And we do have drawings and renderings of what the original aspect of Baghdad. Now that today this is the Kadamiya district of Baghdad, which is built around the Kadamiya shrine and the very complex terrain that is found in and around it, which is now a marketplace. It's impressive, though, looking at the layout and the design of what Baghdad was, and we're looking at a time frame that was well over a thousand years ago. There's other impressive edifices within Baghdad, such as this public library with its very impressive dome and cupola, entryways, and walls. We also see other structures that may be used for residential purposes, and we can see the advanced architectural stylings of columns that are integrated within a very well-decorated wall on two floors. And this certainly looks legitimate. We see the gold-covered domes of the Kadamiya Shrine and the minarets around it, and this is an impressive structure that endures to this day and is the centerpiece of Baghdad and the Kadamiya district. We also have many other mosques and religious buildings, along with supporting buildings that show columns and arches and the advanced architecture that we find ourselves somewhat surprised to see. This is a concept drawing of what Baghdad may look like in the future, but I wonder if this is actually a concept drawing of what Baghdad could have looked like in the past. We have many different accounts of what a wondrous and otherworldly city Baghdad was in the distant past. And I'm not beginning to wonder if a lot of these renderings and these drawings are showing us a different picture of what it may have actually looked like at the height of its glory. A lot of people think of Baghdad as this, as this is the primary footage that you'll see out of it. 
At least you did see out of it when it was featured more prominently in the news, with many brutalist architecture buildings. But there's so much more to it when you look deeper into Baghdad, where you see the surviving mosques and the newer mosques with their domes and their minarets, and the very impressive architecture that went into them. The explanation is the same as you'll find in any other city across the land. Political leaders looking to influence religious leaders and providing them grants and money and looking to build up their legacy. I'm still impressed, though, by how so much of these buildings and the details within them endure, such as looking at the dome on this mosque and the minaret, along with the details in the walls and the arches, and each of the definitive blocks that go into it. We can find older paintings that show that this glory of Baghdad's architectural achievements have always been around. So what was the exact origin date behind all these buildings? I'm told that the mosque and a lot of them may be over a thousand years old. How old are they really? Are they that old or are they older? Is the Katamiya Mosque something from a completely different time? Well, even going off the official account, it's something from a completely different time. In the game Assassin's Creed, they even tried to depict what Baghdad looked like at the height of its glory. And we see a very impressive and otherworldly city that defies simple explanation. Even to this day, looking at many of the mosques and other structures in Baghdad, you will see the beauty of detail and art integrated in every wall, every arch, and every window. And now we go to Mashhad, which is built around the Imam Reza Shrine, another circular city just like Baghdad, and another holy Shia city, much like the Kadamiya district in Baghdad. It's very intriguing to think, though, that these cities are many miles apart, with Mashhad being located in northeast Iran. Here's where it is exactly, and we're moving further east on the Silk Road, and Mashhad at its intersection point today between Iran, Afghanistan, and Turkmenistan, which we did explore Ashgabat on another exploration on this channel. This shrine is just every bit as impressive as the one we just looked at in Baghdad, and in some ways, it has even more architectural styling and artistic detail within the building, as you see looking up at this arch. It seems as though no detail was spared, not only on the structure, but also in the painting. I've never quite seen anything more beautiful with a combination of colors inside a building. I can see why these buildings have such a spiritual effect on people. And you even look at the doors and the grandeur of how they're decorated. Every detail seems to be considered, and it seems to inspire the human spirit when you go in and out of these buildings. Just looking at them almost feels like you're transported to another world, another dimension. And I think this is one of the aspects that we tend to miss when we think of this particular area of the world, because we oftentimes focus only on the conflict that we don't see all the innate beauty within these buildings. This is truly extraordinary, and I think the only place I've seen that matches this is going back to our exploration of Moscow or St. Petersburg. Looking here at the interior of this dome is extremely impressive, where you see each of the arches, the lights, and then also the way the walls and the ceiling are decorated. The outside is no less impressive looking at the dome and the arches here as well, but then there's also the way that the walls and the dome are decorated on the outside. I wonder how this was originally done. Looking at a major hotel in Mashhad, the Ghazla Hotel, I believe it is called, we do see an interesting consideration where this hotel was supposedly built at the start of the 21st century. Now, are these genuine architectural stylings, or are these merely a facade? Was this a building that existed in the distant past and was renovated, or was this actually a building that was just built at the start of the 21st century and was brought up to look like an old world building. It's hard to say, but I integrate it within the presentation here because it's important to distinguish between these two types of buildings. If you just look at this hotel, you get the feeling this very well could be an old world building, but it could also simply be a facade or simply trying to replicate an old world building. It would be very interesting to go here in person and actually check what the construction materials are to ascertain exactly what we have going on here, especially within this lobby, because we do see some very impressive architectural detailing. The outside of this hotel is very impressive as well, because there are some of the details that we've noticed in many other outstanding and stunning structures, such as the small dome, the pediment, and even some of the columns. So what's really the story with this hotel? Well, if you've been in through or around this area, let me know in the comments or just based on your observations and own research, or even your intuition, which is important as well. 
This is what Mashad looked like before they started to modernize, as they say, the shrine or the mosque in the area. And it still looks like it was very beautiful in the past. Going back to the hotel, you can see that the dome and the columns factored together very well, but it almost looks like we can tell that perhaps this is a bit more of a facade than some of the genuine construction that we've seen in older buildings. This most certainly is not a facade. And here we can see on the interior of one of the main domes the beauty and the decoration looking up within it. This is something that really defies the ability of words to describe. And then looking at the numerous exterior photos of this mosque, and you can see that even the floor has a very stunning beauty to it where it reflects these lights. And then, of course, the way they decorate each of the arches on these doorways. And a lot of times, just going through and around these buildings, even in looking in photographs or in live imagery, you find yourself just stunned by the beauty that you see. There's clearly much more going on here, and the standard explanation will be that this is a religious building that politicians supported over time. Even the original mausoleum has a beauty to it, even looking at the older photographs, which don't even have color to them. They still convey the sense of artistic integration and an architectural capability that seems to be beyond a lot of the things that we are either motivated to do or capable of doing in our contemporary era. Looking at the beauty of the gold dome and then the arched entryway and then the tower behind it, there seems to be so many more things that are hidden within this incredible shrine. And when we consider the fact that the account says that Mashad was originally built around it, it adds to many questions that we have. Going back to the hotel though, it almost seems puzzling to look at some of the details on the inside. Is this real? Is this an old building? We know that the mosque is most certainly a legitimate and genuine building, and so we compare and contrast it with what we see to the hotel. Which one feels more genuine? Which one does our intuition tell us is the true old world building? Looking at the greater Mashad area, we can see that this is a modern city that we're told is expanding very rapidly and has done very well economically in more recent times. Back to the exterior of the mosque, we can see more of the exterior architectural details, but then they also had the ability to put in small gazebos and towers in and through and around this very incredible mosque. And you can see on the outside in many plazas across Mashhad, which is considered Iran's holiest city, why it is considered as such. The mosque itself just is not something that we can easily explain, especially if we concern ourselves with its original construction date. Outside, we can see that there's even more complicated integrations of architectural styles and the way that it was built. Going back to the hotel, it does give us the impression that there's more going on with the complicated spiral staircase. So I'll ask you to compare and contrast the mosque and the hotel and see if you can determine which one's different. It should also be noted that Mashad has its own definition of brutalist buildings that seem to be going up. So I guess it's really a modern city after all. And now we're going to look at random towers and tombs along the Silk Road in northeastern Iran. And we have some very impressive towers. What's unique about this is we have to remember that we are in a very remote, isolated, and arid area. So it would be difficult to construct structures such as this, especially in the time frame that we're told that they're constructed, 700 to 900, common era, as they like to tell us. But who knows for sure? When we look at some of these structures and the blocks that were used to build them out, we can see that they also have dome structures on them as well. Built with blocks, it is very impressive. And not just that, there's also many towers that are isolated. Now, some of these, we're told, are shrines, they're tombs, they're to commemorate some very famous religious leader or some sort of prophet or other individual. This one looks very familiar, this particular tower, with the way the columns are integrated into the wall and then underneath the roof. It's amazing that this is still standing. And I'm also reminded of the Garfield mausoleum that we looked at when we explored Cleveland in Ohio. Why is there so much similarity between these two buildings? Is it just a coincidence? What's your explanation for this? There's many other interesting architectural stylings within Iran. And of course, we're told that it was the location of the Persian and the Sassanid empires. 
We see there are other examples of these towers with these unique blocks and bricks that are fashioned together in very unique and intricate patterns. It shows an advanced know-how. This tower, we're told, is a tower of a Jewish individual named Daniel. This is called the Tower of Daniel that stands in Iran, and this structure still stands today. This would certainly be an interesting structure to explore and ascertain exactly what the construction material is. It looks very beautiful and very modern. It almost looks like it's from some sort of fantasy world. We can see that some of these towers do exist in the urban areas, and they do show a different architectural styling than what we see from the mosques. There's also even more ornate details where we have the way these blocks are all stacked together in these beautiful and intricate patterns. And look at those almost knotted rope patterns with the bricks at the top of the columns going into the roof. This is extremely impressive and I would be very interested to see exactly how this was done originally. This is beyond the ability of words to describe and it would be interesting to see someone actually stacking all these blocks or bricks. And what exactly is this material originally made out of? Is this sandstone? Is this some type of concrete? Or are these just bricks in the way that we think of bricks, looking at this tower? Yet we see other intricate details and stylings on these beautiful towers. And their array of functions, whether it's to commemorate some religious figure or some political leader in the distant past. These are very impressive, and if these are indeed over a thousand years old, given the effects of natural erosion, and there is some extreme wind erosion in the arid environment, you also have to consider the fine dust and sand, how is it all these towers, all these columns, all these pillars that still stand today are holding up so incredibly well? A lot of them almost look as though they're brand new in some ways. Yes, you can see the erosion of dust and the staining on them, but yet the structural integrity, the fact that there's still so much detail, is very impressive. Never quite seen anything like it. And here, even looking at this tomb of the previous rulers of the long-gone Persian Empire, at least that's what we're told this particular site is, and look at how they supposedly carved out some of these tombs within the side of the rock. Is that what indeed really happened? Or is there some other explanation for the existence of these tombs here? And even this cube structure and part of this mausoleum, never quite seen anything exactly like this. And this seems to be a lot of effort to go through for a tomb. Now, of course, being kings of the Persian Empire, perhaps it would make sense. And here we have the Tower of Silence. The Tower of Silence was supposedly a Zoroastrian burial site, the religion of Zoroastrianism, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Apparently, they believe that and this is a very morbid account, the bodies of their dead had to be picked clean by buzzards or other scavengers, and they would arrange the bodies in this Tower of Silence for the scavengers to do the work and pick their bodies clean of flesh, and then the bones would be deposited into a pit at the bottom. There is supposedly one older picture that depicts this, but it's hard to say if this is a true account or if there was something else that was going on. We're also told that the current proponents of this religion no longer practice this burial. Regardless of what the truth is, this is a very impressive structure. And we can see that the fact that this is held up for, again, over a thousand years, as many of these other structures, it's impressive. Going back to the necropolis, though, of the old Persian dynasty, we can see the different vaults of each of the rulers and where they're buried. I also find it interesting that they know one of them has an unfinished tomb although it looks like they made some progress on it. And then, of course, we have the little cube building there to the left. What's really going on here? What's the actual origin to this? Again, these towers are all extremely impressive, even with the protruding aspects of their side walls. How exactly were they built? How were they built with such precision? Why do they stand well today? We end the exploration by looking at the ruins of Merv, and we're in the same general vicinity of northeast Iran, close to the border of Turkmenistan, in that area between there and Afghanistan. Merv is known for its ruins that have a very peculiar look to them. You'll see that there are many blocks and bricks that made up what was once a great fortress. At least that's what we'll be told it is. Here in this old photo from the 19th century, we see a very peculiar pile of many bricks and rubble with this particular structure. Now, what actually causes something to rubble like that? Well, we'll be told it's the effects of time, such as with this fortress. This fortress that 
has the appearance of being melted. Well, perhaps that's just what happened from sitting out in the sun in the desert for over a thousand years. Yet you can see other structures that are supposedly from the same time frame that have held up extremely well. Where you can see each of the individual bricks, you can still see the domes and even the areas that protrude and the concave and convex areas. This is all very impressive architecture and it's even more impressive when we consider the fact that this is an isolated area in the middle of an arid region. And it's very thoroughly studied to this day. Looking on the inside of these ruins, we can see that this is brick or block of some type and that there are still modern researchers who are trying to ascertain the exact dimensions and composition of these buildings. Here you can see the remnants of the fortress wall and we can see blocks towards the base. And yet the walls are very impressive. Is there some sort of facading that's put around the bricks or was it some other construction technique? The fact that so much of this fortress still stands after what it's been subjected to is extremely impressive. And it reflects the craftsmanship and the architectural capability of whoever originally built this fortress. This is supposedly called the temple or the building of ice for some reason. And of course on the outside it looks very melted. I, again, I can't imagine why if it's just because it sat on the sun. Yet on the inside I'm reminded of those amazing kilns that John Levi explored in Utah. This almost looks like a much larger one with the same kind of brick layout. And then there's still other ruins where we can still see the bricks making up part of the walls. Overall, Merv is a very extraordinary location. It's something I would enjoy exploring on the ground to really get an idea of what is still standing there, what's the actual composition of these blocks, and how well this overall site fits together to this day. It's a testament to what came in the past was truly able to achieve. This is one of the oldest remaining artificial structures that were admitted to by the mainstream is artificial in Merv. And it's very intriguing in how it reflects yet another circular pattern. And it reminds us of how when we looked at the earlier layouts of both Baghdad and Mashhad, we saw the same circular pattern. Again, many different blocks and bricks in this old building. And yet on the inside, you can still see a lot of the beautiful decorations. And remember, this is just a building sitting out in the middle of a very arid area, isolated. It still retains this kind of beauty. And even on the outside, with all the details that go in the domes and all the small arches, and you'd call them windows, but really access points into the dome. It's impressive architecture, and it's even more impressive it endures to this day. Well... Later today, we're going to be conducting a live stream exploration, myself and Old World Exploration, and you are cordially invited. Please join us and see the link on the site. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Welcome to the Restituto Orbis channel and today we're going to be examining lost technology of the old world and our exploration today takes us to Southeast Asia. We're going to be examining some of the stunning temples and temple complexes that we have. Isn't it interesting how we always tend to call things temples or tombs, especially when we're referring to anything outside of what we consider the so-called Western world or when we're looking in the distant past. It's as though people in the past had nothing better to do, so they were simply going to build temples and tombs. And it's a little bit of a way of referring to the fact that many of these accounts that we have for these stunning structures seem to simply be hand-waved accounts. We don't really have a good explanation, we can't really contrive a good historical account, so we're simply going to see, say that it's a temple, it's a religious structure, or it's a tomb, which serves religious purposes as well, but we decided to devote a lot of time to it. 
And isn't it funny how that seems to be the go-to explanation for many of these stunning structures, which we certainly know we couldn't construct today. For example, here in Angkor Wat, we have a tower that could possibly be related to power generation. Or does it have other possibilities for what the original purpose of this structure really was? When we look on the ground, we see a very unique and stunning appearance of construction materials that we have no idea how long they've been there. And what was the exact process used to construct this very unique temple complex? We're going to examine these and we're also going to try to posit some theories for what the real purpose of these buildings were beyond just simply being towers and tombs. And our first exploration takes us to Wat Aran in Bangkok, Thailand. And we can see that uh, Bangkok is a very complex city and it's certainly one worthy of a full city exploration and will be coming in the following months when we move to Southeast Asia. But for right now we're staying focused on the temple of Wat Aran, which just happens to be right off the major river running through the center of Bangkok. And we also have an exploration concerning rivers as well because they're rather interesting. We see the main prang or tower surrounded by several smaller prangs. And getting on the ground we can see that this temple is extremely advanced in its construction. We can see that this main tower has construction techniques in it in methods that we couldn't easily replicate today even if we were building a small model of it. That's maybe one one hundredth scale. And of course people will tell us it's because back in Thailand in the day they worked harder, they didn't have safety standards. And yes, I know we go over that many times. But even looking at the approach to the temple, we can see advanced construction techniques. And we'll be told that this is a Buddhist temple and that it's because of the devotion to the study of Buddhism that's what facilitated the construction of this temple. That's always the explanation. And yet the main praying and some of the subsidiary architecture is very impressive as we have many surrounding and smaller towers, which gives the impression that there was a completely different purpose behind this temple. And really this is a temple complex itself, even though they just say it's a temple. And what was its original purpose? Was it for power generation? Was it designed to contribute to the spirit of the people? Wat Aran, Temple of the Dawn, it's Buddhist. We're told it was founded in 1656, but then the main praying was built during the 19th century? Why is it everything was constructed in the 19th century? And even in Southeast Asia, we can't escape that uh, particular narrative tone. And yes, I am going to say the word narrative because that's what it is. It's as though the entire world was built in the 19th century. Now, they don't exactly know when this original temple was built. They just say it's always sort of been there. But assure, let us assure you that the main praying was constructed in the 19th century. Because when else would it be constructed? Looking, though, at some of the details, we see something that reflects of a long-gone past glory with this particular temple. We see more of a natural construction technique. And by natural, something that appears a lot more organic. There's something much more than what we'll see in our favorite architectural stylings of Brutalist. No, nobody was thinking of Brutalist here in the 19th century when they constructed this. And interestingly enough, this particular temple has been renovated as well. So once again, it appears as though they're obfuscating the account. But you can appreciate and see the great beauty in the architectural detailing. How exactly did they do all this? Are we to believe that a veritable army of thousands descended upon this site to find chisel and carve out all of these impressive figures and all of these beautiful works of natural art and that they spent years and years doing so or in the 19th century when they made this made temple what's interesting though is that or the main praying what's interesting though is that the subsidiary temples or the subsidiary prangs and towers have the exact same appearance to them as the main tower so stepping outside the box here and stepping outside what our given historical account is I'm speculating on what the real purpose of this temple really was. And we see something that could have been anything from power generation to perhaps a gathering place to restore the spiritual health of the people at the time. I think there's a reason why many of these surviving structures from the old world tend to be labeled as religious structures. Because they do seem to have a little bit of a religious or a spiritual effect to them. But if we go back to what their original intended purpose was, if they were designed to reinvigorate the spirit within the individual, because we speculate that in the past civilization there was a balance between the individual and the society that they lived in, then the real function 
of religion and spirituality in that society was to also reinvigorate the individual. Now, we're told that continues to this day in our major religions, and yes, you can still find that, but I'm not wondering if that's a nice little parallel that happens to continue with all these structures. And I believe that when you look at the beauty of this particular praying or main tower here in Bangkok, you can see a lot of that beauty reflected within it. But could there have been other purposes, other intentions behind this very impressive structure? And really, I, I would just like to hear what some of your theories are and how they actually built this. And I know one of the prevailing theories is now geopolymers, but you still have to actually have the logistical capacity to move all these geopolymers and actually pour all this. So how was it really done? Was it done with some sort of advanced infrastructure system, which it had to have been done? Advanced roads, advanced travel systems? Or was it done with some sort of aerial delivery system? Some sort of advanced airships that we've speculated on? We'll see what appears to be the added Buddhist elements of this temple, and it does reflect of the great spirituality that accompanies Buddhism. And indeed, all the major religions of the world reflect great spirituality in their baseline statements, and yet all of them have the same institutions that accompany them. So it's quite a fascinating dichotomy when you're trying to understand and explain what the religious effect of a particular relig religious structure is, and compare and contrast that with what the institution of the religion is telling you about it. It's also fascinating when you think about the fact that our religions are supposed to be about focus on spirituality and an internal focus, and yet we seem to have such a devotion to an external focus. And really what I'm doing is I'm just examining the mainstream account there, because we're told one thing, but then we're showed something different, and then we do something that's different from what we're told and what we're shown. And that's something we have to question, because I believe there is a lot of validity in our major religions, and I believe that the basic tenets of them are something that reflect the older world, the concept of achieving a real balance between the individual. And for whatever reason, in many of the tenets of Far Eastern philosophy, it seems as though the older world seems to have survived intact, and it's not something that's mingled or muddled by the whole concept of words. And you can certainly look in the book 1984 to see how language can be altered, even speaking the exact same language, because you can change the meanings of words. Let's just take the word sanction, for example. Sanction, a word in the English language that has two entirely opposite meanings. You sanction my videos? What do you really mean? Are you supporting my production of these videos? Or are you saying that I am not allowed to produce the videos? That's just one example. And the reason I highlight that example is because I believe we see this contradiction. This contradiction is present everywhere when you examine the structure in Bangkok, Thailand. You see a structure that is very advanced, and yet you're supposed to believe that in the 19th century, a bunch of individuals managed to carve all this out. At least that's what I think the mainstream would have us believe. But do they have some other very elaborate explanation for it? They managed to channel water from the river, and then the river slowly grounded out the structure of this impressive temple. Now, I know one of the comments I've gotten is the images that I show are not always of the finest quality. And one of the reasons that I do that is I want to show a little bit of a different impression of the images. There's also something that I question with the constant use of high-definition images. Now, I'm not saying that I suspect that high-definition images are altered, but it's intriguing to me how when I viewed one of my favorite films in high-definition, I noticed that somehow it seems to have been changed in subtle ways, as opposed to looking at the original film in its original definition. Now, it's almost as though we're being conditioned to want to see things in a particular way. Now, my personal preference would be to actually get on the ground and really do an on-site exploration of this impressive temple in Thailand. Yet, we can still get the idea, and I'm simply trying to encourage the idea, that we need to do our own explorations. We need to do our own research, and every individual should follow up as they feel fit on trying to explain what the original origin of this impressive temple in Bangkok really was. And that was actually how I facilitated my classes back when I did teach. And, of course, I drew a great deal of criticism and 
derisive comments from some of my colleagues because they thought I should just be doing lectures all the time and if I bored my students out of their mind then they would retain it. And it's always interesting how none of them had any interest in talking about history or wanting to think about it after time. But isn't it funny how many people now suddenly seem to be coming out of the woodwork and challenging alternative explanations for what they believe are well-documented historical events? There certainly has to be a reason behind that. What exactly do the figures represent here in the tower? Are the figures some sort of advanced human beings of the past? Do they represent some sort of spiritual originality that we had? Or are they simply reflections of a long past time? One of the things that's crossing my mind when I look at this temple is, is this really a temple from the fourth era? Or could this actually be a surviving structure from the third era? It is entirely possible that there were some structures that may have survived the reset from the third to the fourth era. And perhaps this reflects one of them, and that's how we can explain what appears to be great age in this main praying or tower. We're told by the mainstream that they had to do renovations in the 2010s on this main tower. Now, why are we always doing renovations? Again, we have some of the same story beats with all of these wonderful edifices, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in Europe, Russia, or down here in Thailand, that these structures are eroding over time because they were poorly constructed. And I find it very hard to believe that this main tower was actually built in the 19th century. But perhaps it was built in a period of time that we're simply told was the 19th century, and it's far older. Could there also be some more radical explanations for what this structure originally was? Was this some sort of incredible power generation structure? Look at these interesting figures here by this building. And of course you have the pointy tower. And what exactly do these figures represent? Hmm. Okay, look, I'm going to go there. I'm just going to say that uh, these remind me of uh, the guards from the movie Big Trouble in Little China. Even though this doesn't have anything to do with China, there's no doubt that this very unique aesthetic influenced that film. Now, could John Carpenter have been trying to communicate something to us by telling us about that film and those figures? Certainly. This is one of the oldest images that we have of this particular temple. And I find it interesting that this is from the 19th century, and, of course, they're not going to show you the main praying. Not because I'm suggesting that it was already there. I'm just saying that they coincidentally don't show it in any of the old photos. And don't even ask me about construction photos because I have a feeling that there are none to be found. I couldn't find any in my initial attempts, but maybe you can find some and let me know and share them. It'd be interesting to see what kind of construction photos they have of a structure such as this. <laughs> Just hang up the tarps and you'll be shielded from the wind as you are very carefully carving all these intricate detailed figures. Now, the Buddha statues here are interesting because they do appear to have been added later, but were they? Or was there some other explanation? And of course, we have advanced columns with decoration towards the top. So you can see that it wasn't just the Romans who did the advanced columns. What else, what else is advanced, though, in this tower is also seeing how it's layered and detailed. Now, someone will try to tell us that, yes, this matches the great Gothic carvings that they did in Europe when they built all those cathedrals over the last thousand years. But does it really? And then there's always the explanation of, well, these are different cultures across different lands. But one of the things we suspect with the fourth era is that all these cultures were present. It's just that they managed to live together in harmony and achieve a joint civilization. So it is possible that this structure could have come from the fourth era. But for some reason, I'm suspecting that it came from the third era and that all the attempts at renovation to make it look newer are to try to reflect that. Here, even on this image, you can see in this little, we'll just call it a banister, all the detail that's carved on it. And you can see it behind these individuals as well in this photo. Very impressive. Well, let's consider Mount Muru, and one thing I didn't mention about the temple we just looked at, and the temple we're going to look at, is that the central towers reflect Mount Muru. What's the explanation behind Mount Muru? Well, it's a cosmological explanation that comes from Buddhism, that Mount Muru represents the main mountain that all life on the lands came from. And it's a very interesting consideration because we think about how life may have evolved on the land. And is this a more accurate story of our origin? 
We're not exactly certain, but it is intriguing to me how Mount Muru may well be reflected on those old maps that we look at, especially when we look at a certain polar region that we're not supposed to discuss. And there are many different depictions for the concept of Mount Muru, and it's intriguing for me to realize that Mount Muru doesn't necessarily reflect a geographically limited area. It reflects the existence of all things, that all life and all structure of the lands revolves around Mount Miru. So is it something that's really limited by a geographical definition, or is it something that manages to be both? And oftentimes these are confusing and conflicting thoughts, but given the fact that we deal with nothing but conflict from even our mainstream account, it's how we have to approach things. A lot of the artwork and a lot of the genesis of Mount Miru is very beautiful, and it's one of the baseline tenets of the origin of the lands and I think there's a lot to be said for it. There's also the fact that many of the structures are supposedly built to reflect Mount Miru. Now could it be possible that this is a remnant of an older philosophy? There's no doubt about it. And here, is this a representation of Discworld for those of you that are familiar with that uh, fictional or science fiction story where we have the turtle and the elephants that's actually carrying the known land on it? Well, it seems to be something that's reflected in the artwork quite frequently. And perhaps within this, we can find more accurate descriptions for what the, t what the true genesis and development of the land was over the time. Well, let's go and look at our other structure, or temple or temple complex, because we're not looking at tombs today. And we head over to Cambodia to look at Angkor Wat. And we can see very developed temple complexes here with fine geometrical patterns. Now the mainstream tells us that Angkor Wat is the largest religious structure in the lands. But I question that, and I don't question that because I question the true beauty and utter amazing aspects of this structure, which we can see here on the ground. But the reason I question that is I don't wonder if the mainstream is trying to mislead us because there are many things that are conflicting. Now, are they trying to intentionally mislead us, or are they just incidentally misleading us? Well, that's a question we can debate at some other time. But once again, we see a very advanced temple complex. Very unique figures here. Are these reflecting lions, jackals, or something else? Or some other creature that may have existed from a time long past? And don't worry, the mainstream has an explanation for us, and even though they say that evolution could have been included every sort of creature ever imagined to have existed, they can assure us that these creatures did not exist. So don't bother trying to question it through that means. Look at some of the very advanced construction details though in this temple complex. And we're, we're told that these are the architectural efforts of the 12th century from the Khmer Empire. <sighs> so once again, we have kings and we have empires in Southeast Asia and don't expect to find anything else, especially from the past. We see very impressive pillars and columns, and yet they have a different uh, artistic appeal to them, and yet we can see the figures. So overall, we have Angkor Wat, and we're told it's in the Angkor Wat style. It's a Hindu-Buddhist temple complex, and construction took place over 28 years in the 12th century. And we know the king, and we know the religious figure who inspired the king to do it. Once again, reflecting the same pattern of stories that we have from Europe and from across the lands. So it's as though our imagination and our historical account is not that good. Or if it is accurate, it seems that human beings are a lot more alike than we like to admit. But if we're so much alike, then why are we always so fixated on killing each other or trying to say that one group is superior to another or one group is inferior to another? Which we still do. We're tricked into doing it quite effectively every day. This temple complex is stunning to look at, and it really boils the question down, was there something from the era that this was originally constructed in where we have a true integration with nature? Because you can even see there's something much more organic with this entire temple complex. And the explanation will be, well, it's closing on a thousand years old, so given the fact that it's down there in Southeast Asia and the environment's different, it's a jungle and there's a lot more rain, it only makes sense. But actually what I find impressive is that with the effects of that unrelenting humidity that that area is known for, all of these structures have endured so well. And look at all these figures. And what exactly does this originally represent? 
there seems to be some sort of aspect of humanity that we're seeing here that goes beyond the simple explanation that we have for our religious tenets. I'm not discounting them, but I can understand why someone would come across a structure like this and simply want to label it a temple or a tomb. Because how else do you really explain it? And even with all of our supposed advanced methods of construction and technology that we have now, could anybody do this? Could anybody build a temple complex like this now? And if they could, how long would it take? Those are the kind of questions we have to ask. And what is the true nature of the construction material within this temple complex? Is this a geopolymer? Is this some sort of advanced construction material that we can't even begin to imagine? Something that they were able to form in place in sectionals and then place in the actual structure and fix together in means that we can't even begin to understand. Some of these images are just truly astounding with the fact that we see an integration of nature with this artificial structure. And I find that looking at the images of this structure indicate that this is something that's far older than we've been led to believe. And yet you still see the precision and the detail in all these figures. An army of individuals that just decided to go up there and carve this during very difficult times in the 12th century. And yet these figures are of the very finest that we've seen across all the lands. The intricate detail. So while there is the explanation that this has something to do with power generation, I believe that the original origin of the structure had many more purposes than simple power generation. And we also have to remember that if this is a surviving structure from the third era, then what we're looking at is something that's small in terms of scale, because we believe that there were much larger structures that were destroyed by much greater forces at that time. And that which survived was that which was remote in that civilization that existed or was not subjected to the main forces of whatever the particular reset that the Third Era faced. And perhaps that explains a lot of the scorching and degradation that you do see in this very stunning structure. Yet at the same time, so many details have endured. So much of the beauty continues to survive to this day. And this is perhaps the most alluring aspect of Southeast Asia. And it seems as though there was a very concerted attempt during the mid-20th century to, how shall we say, reduce the structures that were in Southeast Asia. Indeed, there's accounts of a conflict between the Khmer Rouge and other forces in Cambodia that led to some damage to this temple complex. Well, fortunately, they were just using small arms and it was not subjected to more of the destructive implements that we know are at the disposal of our current civilization. It is impressive to see that a structure like this has endured for such a time, and it's very inspirational at the same time, because this is not something that I suspect that was built in the 12th century. I suspect that this is much older. But, conversely, could the timeline still be similar or the same? Yes, it could be, because we just don't know. It goes back to that whole concept of the date paradox. What's the baseline event and how much time has actually passed? Here's what you really have to think about. You can't verify what happened firsthand prior to your own existence. It's one of the difficulties that we encounter with these explorations. So what you're left to rely on is the mainstream account that you have or alternative accounts, which may or may not be accurate, or maybe 50% accurate, 50% altered unless we're simply supposed to believe, as the mainstream account would have us believe, that every single historical account was maintained in total objectivity by governments, civilizations, and cultures, yes, cultures, that at the same time they will tell us were inherently corrupt. We're told to respect and appreciate the Roman civilization, and yet at the same time we're relentlessly told about how corrupt they were, how evil they were, and how they practiced the horrifying aspects of a society that had its own decay sewn into its very origin. But I suspect that what we had in the past was something far beyond that. That we did really achieve a balance. A balance between the individual and society. And I think that in surviving structures like Angkor Wat in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia and Thailand, we see examples of that. We see examples of the very pinnacle of what humanity can be. When we express ourselves, and when we manage to explore ourselves on the inside and the outside. 
we'll be looking more at Southeast Asia. Thank you for joining me. Please like, comment, and subscribe.